Mobility and Transportation Infrastructure Commission. I'll start over. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the City of South Pasadena Mobility and Transportation Infrastructure Commission meeting for Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. Leona, if you will call the roll, please. Vice Chair Hughes. Present. Commissioner Abelson. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. And Commissioner Zavala. Here. Staff present, we have Ted Gerber, our Public Works Director, Michael Vart Vartanian, our Principal Engineer, David Pena, our Transportation Program Manager, and Liana DeWitt, uh, the Public Works Assistant. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, may I ask Commissioner Fisher if you would like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? Thank you. Please rise, put your right hand over your heart, ready to begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Um, our next item on the agenda is public comment, general public comment. Leona, do we have any public comment cards tonight or any guests on Zoom? No, we do not. All right, then we will close public comment general. Um, the next item is our first action item, which is discussion regarding our street improvement program. And I see that um, Public Works Director, Mr. Gerber is here. Good evening, sir. Thank you, Vice Chair Hughes. Okay, um, so our first meeting of the year, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, and what an appropriate topic to talk about is our street improvement program. Um, so our last touch on this was around September. Um, we had a full agenda that night. We didn't get to get into this too much. We um, essentially shared with you uh, an area map of how we had apportioned the city into various areas um, as just sort of a brief overview of where um, our, we want our program to head uh, based on our State of Streets uh, special meeting last year. We really didn't get into the details or get to reiterate um, that conversation. So tonight we have a presentation for you to go over that. Um, we're going to have to return to this topic. We're sort of in the middle of it right now. So we want to show you where we are, uh, get some ideas and feedback, and then talk about what the next steps for the program evaluation. Um, so you should have a copy of the presentations in front of you, and we'll have it up here on the screen as well. So just a, uh, sorry, Leon, uh, if you, next slide, if you don't mind. I don't know if I was able to click it. Thank you. Um, so just a reiteration of uh, which projects we are uh, currently working on in various phases. Uh, so if you noticed um, project one, uh, what, if you recall from the State of Streets meeting, we had talked about dividing up the next iteration of work into four projects. Uh, project one, what we referred to project one, uh, other Wise referred to as the 2018-2019 Street Improvement Package, uh, is now in construction. Um, both Sterling and Forest, the pavement had actually been completed as of today, uh, and Alta Vista was ground uh, this morning. It was grinded. Um, and Monterey, uh, a lot of the dig out work has been completed, and that's uh, scheduled for grinding and paving uh, later this week, if not into early next week. So. The, the largest portion of these construction, this first construction project will be done in the next week or so. There are some other aspects to complete. Most of the concrete work's been done, but there's some sidewalk panels to be um, installed, uh, striping, the bike lane at Mon Monterey, uh, some electrical work at the traffic loop at um, Pasadena Monterey, um, new uh, street lamps along Monterey, which takes, there's some lead time behind ordering those. So there project will continue for some while, but the pavement will be done in the next week, which is really exciting. Um, while I'm going to the presentation, please feel free to stop me and ask questions if you we're going to jump around a little bit. Um, so the next project that we talked about, uh, you would refer to this previously as the 1920 uh, improvement package. This is currently in design. Um, we, oh, no, you're fine. Thank you so much. Um, so project two, uh, we had done a, a decent amount of the design when we had last discuss, discussed this. 
But if you recall from our state of streets, one of the things that we're trying to incorporate into new improvement projects is all of the city utilities that need to be completed when we do when we reconstruct the street. So at the moment, we are designing the water and sewer elements that need to be incorporated into the SPID package. Um, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, these streets are placed in different locations in the city. Um, so it takes sort of a unique perspective as to how to look at um, the water improvement in that one street and how it's going to tie into the existing improvements on its neighboring streets that are not getting upgraded and how do we plan for those in the future. And that kind of ties into the area approach that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and so the list of streets that are in the design um, for project two are there. Um, project three is in development. This is our surface treatment project, what our, we would call sort of our annual um, maintenance project that the uh, commission had talked about a list of streets in previous years, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. We have not fully developed this. Um, we're in the process of doing that, uh, more so focusing on getting project to design near complete, um, because really we want the timeline for project three, the slurry project, to be closer to the warmer weather. So we're talking late spring, early summer, that's when we want um, those treatments to set up correctly on the streets. And then project four, um, also in design. This was originally part of project two. This is specifically the Mission Pasadena um, Arroyo Drive intersection, which we'll talk about a, a little bit in detail. Uh, and the reason we're splitting this off from project two is that as you'll notice, project two, mostly what I'll call straightforward residential streets um, versus project four is a much is a bit more of a complicated design to get it right. We don't want that work to hold up project two. And so we're, we basically split that up uh, to do project four a little bit later. It's gonna be a much more expensive project and a lot more detail that goes into that construction. So just to share some photos for you here, um, so on the left, you see what Monterey uh, Road looks like right now. We've completed many of the dig outs. Uh, it's kind of a patchwork. So this would be, um, we have grinders out on the street in the next couple of days. And then as we do paving, um, trying to, we'll be keeping the traffic lanes open. So we'll be doing a couple days of this to um, keep uh, one lane open in each direction. Um, and then you can see some of the dig out work and concrete curb and gutter repair that we're doing along Monterey Road right there. Um, this picture from Forest Avenue is actually from last week. This was uh, the grinding machines moving through. Um, if you go to Forest Ave right now, it's the paving is, is completed. And so we did uh, quite a bit of uh, concrete work there, including some panels. We replaced the um, there's a, there's a city alley there. So we worked on the driveway apron there. Uh, so the idea behind these projects is that uh, we sort of correct the drainage issues and the concrete issues uh, that exist. And some of them we find out about during construction. And then on the right there, you'll see, um, sorry, one more second on that last slide. Thanks, Liana. Uh, you're good, perfect. Uh, on Alta Vista there, uh, that's what it looks like right now. Uh, and we'll have the paving equipment coming through uh, tomorrow. Thank you. So this is a familiar uh, map. This is what we had on display when we were um, talking about these, uh, the next round of um, projects. You could see what we're calling project one, the streets that are currently being paved in green there, Sterling Forest, Monterey, and Alta Vista. Um, and then projects two and four in orange, which is the next set. And so those will also have water and sewer improvements where appropriate on there. And so this map does not show um, the project three surface treatments uh, yet. And there's a reason for that. So okay, can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. If I look at the list, which is our 2018, 2019, I'm seeing the Monterey Road. I'm seeing the Alta Vista forest. And then we also had Alpha and Pine. So um, were those part of what was done or in? Great question. Alpha was done. 
Pine was not, and now Pine is in this project too. So you'll see it in orange on this map. Okay, so then that will go into the 2019-2020 project. That's correct, yeah. So um, what you're pointing out, I'm really happy that you are, is a, a bit of confusion that happened with the different lists of streets. Um, so uh, even Forest wasn't in the original 1819 list it is somehow in the design package and so we did it um and then some of the streets that were sort of organized into the different years um weren't necessarily put into the sb1 um resolutions that we sent to the state about which streets we we're going to do so uh we have a, another slide here that'll show you basically everything that we think was supposed to be captured in one way or another on a project doesn't, I'll put a little spoiler alert in there. It doesn't necessarily mean everything will move forward and we'll talk about why, but we think that we've captured everything um, as far as consideration for everything that's been on a list up okay. to this point. Yeah, because I just want to, you know, it's like we want to be able to check them off and know that, yeah, that was promised and approved or, you know, what are the reasons why we can't now because of other circumstances or what have you? Uh, completely understood. We'll probably uh, cease to call uh, projects by a year moving forward because um, our hope is that design happens in one year and then construction happens in another year and design even might happen a couple of years in advance so that the projects are ready to be built as soon as the construction money is ready. Um, we'll talk about that, how it's going to work with our budgeting. Um, and so we'll, we probably just assign uh, numbers. We've been assigning internal numbers in the department to just projects. And so it won't really make any sense to anyone other than, you know, a four digit number. I just think it project. helps us to know if we can clean it up because we know, and then we know that's all taken care of. Now we've got the new list, new plan, move forward. Yeah. I think what will really help is um, a publicly available map as to what is on the list and what might be coming down the pipe. Um, and that's where we want to head. Thank you. Thank you. And so just uh, a, re a reiteration here. Um, this is the 2020 uh, pavement management program. And this is a familiar map to you all. Uh, and so uh, the first thing I'll say is that um, projects one, two, and four, so the projects are in construction now, the next design package, including Mission Arroyo Pasadena, um, were all selected um, as they should have been based on their pavement condition. So uh, they, in theory, were red on this map. Um, now, uh, one thing I'll note about the way that the 2020 PMP was done is that it assumed that the city was on a regular cycle for getting the projects done. And so when it was published in 2020, it assumed that the projects that we're talking about, some of the projects we're talking about now we're in theory done according to the 2020 rating. So you'll see, um, you might see some projects on here um, in blue, meaning they were in, they're in very good shape because they were assumed by the PMP to be done because the city was planning on doing them. And so rightfully so, the consultant would say, well, why am I, I'm not going to give you a recommendation to redo those streets because you were about to do them, but they might not have been done based on this conversation we're having about various lists. And so under the new 2023 PMP that we're working on right now, I'll share with you, um, the, uh, we're, we're, we want to basically establish a couple scenarios to show like what the actual condition is for all the streets right now and what the map would look like under a couple different scenarios. So simple enough. Um, so again, the streets that were selected were selected purely based on condition, and we want to tweak that approach uh, moving forward. So let me, um, again, you've seen this before. This is taking the um, sewer improvements, the immediate sewer improvements that we need, doesn't include other types of midterm or long-term sewer improvements we need, and many of the water and fire improvements we need. And by fire, I mean upsizing water lines so that they deliver adequate fire flow to either hydrants or buildings that have fire uh, suppressant systems inside them. And so we have a, a large set of needs here where we have to be upsizing or fixing pipes. Um, 
And I'll tell you, um, if we continued on the path that we already had for our stream improvement program, we would have missed some of these. And so now going back on project two and capturing some of these, it increases the cost uh, you know, and, and uh, to a counterpoint to that, it allows us to access other types of money that we can use for sewer and water. Um, but overall, long term, it reduces the cost for the improvements in the city that need to be done. So now project two is addressing um, these upsizing on streets. And that's kind of part of the, the difficulty. I'll give you an example. Um, so we've talked about in this commission about how um, we came to this, we came to be here. Um, there wasn't necessarily funding available to inject into streets over, over many years. And the same thing applied to the water improvements in the city. Um, sometimes a water main might be replaced under unique circumstances. Um, perhaps there was no access to it where it was, where it was located in a, in a parkway. And when a street improvement project came through, it was absolutely necessary to move the water line into the street because, um, if it was broken, if it was breaking, there was no other way to fix it. Um, but many times street projects, if they happened, they would move forward without any water line improvements. And so in the case of say Arroyo Verde, which is one of the streets in our project too, we've got all sorts of water line stuff in, happening in there. There's a, a, a four inch line, a six inch line, there was an eight inch line added just to get to, to provide uh, water to you know, a couple buildings at the end of the street. Um, Metropolitan has water infrastructure there. Um, uh, Los Angeles is looking to have water infrastructure there. And so um, for us just to do that one street and improve the water uh, system on that one street is kind of difficult because of how much it ties into other streets. And if we were to re, let's say we were to start from scratch and redo the network today, we wouldn't do it that way. So we're kind of trying to um, meet halfway by upgrading the lines because we don't want to reconstruct that street again. And at the same time, we're trying to preserve the distribution network in that part of the city because we're not going to be improving the other streets at the exact same time, um, which is another benefit to taking an area approach where you can fix a distribution system um, in one area uh, if that's what you need to do. And that is what the city needs to do. Our water infrastructure is very old and needs to be replaced. Ted, to that interesting point, do we also need to consider um, upgrades where we have consideration for fire? Which I know you, you see fire here, but part of the hills, part of that that we need, and we already know that we've got certain parts of the city with pressure issues. So I don't know if you know, the, the countering of what we need to do to make sure that we can deliver water for fire suppression. And then we've got, then a lot of that's the hill where we've got the pressure issue to be able to get, deliver the water. That's absolutely right. So we're really looking at four things. We're looking at um, capacity for, for fire, um, water delivery. We're working at just the general condition of the pipe. Um, you know, we have some pipes that uh, are holding and we have pipes that have leaks. Um, certainly, on bid package two, if we had moved forward without doing the water lines, we'd be paving over uh, breaks that have happened over the last couple of years. So that's the second uh, consideration. Um, the third consideration is, as you mentioned, pressure issues in the city. So we have a, a new plan as far as water infrastructure upgrades to address uh, low pressures, so sp specifically in the downtown area. Downtown area is known for low pressures. So we have a a plan, and you can kind of see on this map, there's this um, there's this light purple area in the middle. That's going to be a new pressure zone that doesn't exist today based on these upgrades. That purple zone is about, you know, a tenth of the size of what it is at the moment. And by um, by expanding the zone, by, by rebuilding the infrastructure in that area, we actually up the pressures in the downtown area. And that really speaks to the fourth aspect of these improvements is that we have new housing coming in. We have, you know, multifamily units, taller buildings. Um, we need upgrades in certain areas of the city where we know that infrastructure is coming in to support it. And, um, you know, there's an opportunity for us to access developers paying for part of that, but we really need to figure out in advance of developers coming in how that configuration is going to work so we can appropriately apportion out those costs to those those builders. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into it exactly as you mentioned about pressure uh, considerations. One interesting thing to note, the city of Los Angeles recently, the 
to help spur and make it fair. If you need to put a line in and upgrade, um, even a power you know, power line or a water line, that it would be, if you were going to go here, that the, that developer had to pay the whole cost, but now they're working on prorating it so that someone would come and you're encouraging other development so that the developer is, isn't covering the whole thing, but you're kind of piecemealing it to try to get other development nearby to come yeah. in. So then they everyone's, the, the first guy in is not paying the full load. And then, but then as a city, we would have to hold some of that, but it's the, you would get your money back in the encouragement of making it easier for development. It's a really good point. And we've had a couple different situations like that. So there's a couple developers in the city um, where we had envisioned, you know, one developer over here and one over here uh, sort of working together to build a common larger line that would service that area of the city. Um, but how do you go about doing that? What what typically happens is both developers want to find the cheapest solution. And sometimes it's them just pulling in a line from over here and another pulling a line from over here to meet the needs of their particular building um, and not necessarily doing it in a way that's coordinated and helps the city. And so we really, you know, in uh, another circumstance, we might have allowed that because we're looking at projects like this and saying, OK, you need to get pressure to your building, pull in from over here and do it. But if we take a step back and look at this uh, macroscopically, then we we do exactly what you're saying. So the key is how do you go about doing that, um, you know, sort of forcing developers to work together, even if they're different different stages in the approval process, which is very difficult. Um, one way we're looking at this is basically trying to de develop these districts, perhaps, but that idea might not really come to fruition. It's really a financial model that we're trying to work out. Um, and we've got some assistance. We're talking to the finance team about this, about how to go about um, setting that up, essentially. Because the other component, the developer would be able to also pay for the street, street improvement and repairs for new lining, new striping, new all of that, depending on what they're developing. That's very true. So at the moment, um, we have kind of two scenarios that happen. We have, uh, you know, depending on the, the um, size of the project, we may have a developer identify the existing condition of the street, and then they'll make improvements based on the existing condition of the street, how their projects impacted it. Because if you have somebody who's just doing like a small remodel of a commercial building, it's kind of tough to, you know, put a new whole new road construction on their um, plate. But if you have somebody who's developing, you know, a good half of the city block, it's easy for us to add that as a condition of approval that they're going to repave the street. And there's questions about what the extent of that should be. Um, but having a common approach would be a good thing for the city to have. Um, so on the uh, next slide here, um, we skipped over project three and don't worry, we're coming to talk about that again. Um, but we'll talk about project four. So um, We've touched on this in the past. Uh, and so this is uh, a lower priority, I'll just say, as far as um, work resources, because we only have, our consultant has many clients and we only have, have so many staff. So we're really trying to focus on getting project two designed and bid. And then the project three, um, what I'll call just like the slurry package, uh, com the streets selected and that picked and out. Uh, and then project four, hopefully it will come in right behind that. But we want to give you a preview of what we're looking at here. And we've talked about these options in the past, but this is a little bit of a refinement. Um, so this is the existing configuration of the street. You're all very familiar with it. Um, what we have is that Arroyo Drive and Mission Street, that stop sign, stop sign typically can get knocked over. Um, it's difficult to cross this area of street. And even as a driver, um, as you approach Mission Arroyo and Stony, the intersection is very spaced out. Um, and it's hard to kind of negotiate whose turn it is to to take the stop. Um, on the passing emission side, you know, if you're coming um, west from Mission, it's kind of like you have to really wait to get in there because the traffic on Mission and Pasadena doesn't stop. Um, we have um, reflective lights on uh, Pasadena Avenue that we currently have out of service. Um, it is difficult to see those when you're coming on a curve uh, from Mission, Mission Street to down to Pasadena Avenue. And so, uh, you know, our goal, we had many goals in looking at the design on um, Project 4. I'm going to jump to the next slide here. And that is to create um, 
walkable pedestrian areas all the way around both intersections. Um, square, narrow the intersections to so bring the cars closer together and also square off the intersections as much as possible. So vehicles are meeting at a 90 degree angle um, and there may even be an opportunity to have a um, either a stop or maybe one day a signal controlled intersection on Mission and Pasadena. So um, here's the, I, the idea. Uh, and so what I wanna do is just kind of jump between this slide and the next slide, just to kind of give you a frame of reference. Dan, if you don't mind doing the next slide. Uh, sorry, the next one there. This is kind of an overlay. It's not very exact because our survey CAD drawing doesn't lay directly on the aerial that's at an angle from Google Earth. We can kind of see what we're doing here is we're really proposing to cut off a lot of the north part of the street, turn it into a green space to, to narrow the street, provide a pedestrian walkway, um, and then really square off uh, Mission and Pasadena to have, um, we'll have to re-angle the crosswalks. Of course, you can see where the yellow um, uh, ladder crosswalks don't line up with our new crosswalk configuration. And that's because we want 90 degree angle um, approaches there. Um, and then we're also able to um, allow uh, cyclists to move through that intersection a little bit easier. Now there's, we, we toyed with an idea of having an actual bike lane between the two intersections, but we think it actually makes sense to have the bike lane along Mission and Pasadena and then have uh, Sharrows on Mission Street because we've kind of slowed everything down and be easy for cyclists to navigate between the two, but they'll have um, established bike lanes on Arroyo Drive and uh, Pasadena and, and Mission there. Um, so, you know, again, this is some time in the making here. We don't have to have comments tonight, but if you want to take a look at this and, and sort of think about it, the downsides of this design are, um, you know, the driveway at the north side there uh, it's a little bit difficult that right now that person can get into their driveway from every which angle they want to, but this would really kind of control that driveway access to um, from one direction. Um, it also depends on what the future Mission Street configuration is for bike lanes. So we're assuming that there's bike lanes on Mission Street based on previous conversations here at the commission. And so we, we would kind of build out the intersection with a disconnected bike lane to the rest of Mission until, you know, one day it carries through, um, and then you know it would pro it may limit parking in this area too. There's a couple parking spots on that small section of Mission Street that would likely go away under this scenario, um, but we think that might be worth it to get this intersection really cleaned up. Every time we're here observing it, which has been several times, um, we see cyclists and pedestrians trying to make their way through here especially because the amenities at, uh, on Stony Drive. Yes. Thank you, Ted. Could you go back to, yeah, thank you. Um, so this configuration shows one lane in each direction on Mission Street. And that presumes that that will be the operation and maybe that would tie into the uh, lane reduction near uh, near Meridian, is that, is that true? So that's a good question. Um, at the moment, the lane reduction at Meridian ends at, um, I think we have it at, uh, that project ends at Orange Grove. Um, so even though we have, we, so right now we have two lanes between Orange Grove and Mission, I'm sorry, Orange Grove and uh, Pasadena, so at a future project, if that's the direction we want to go, we would basically carry through that configuration from Orange Grove to this intersection. So we'd set this up. Uh, we'd have to have a lane. You'd have to have a lane narrowing, um, a lane drop west of here. Uh, and then it eventually would tie into what's going on um, along Meridian up to Orange Grove. Because if you recall from our conversation, our approach is to take the road diet and actually extend it all the way to Orange Grove. I think that's like a direction that the commission uh, gave us previously. Okay, and also um, today it's a little confusing because we have two westbound lanes on Mission 
and one continues to Pasadena and the other one uh, is kind of trapped on to uh, continue all the way to. Uh... Yes, Arroyo, yeah. Yeah, to Arroyo. So this looks like it will eliminate that problem that there will only be one westbound lane until you get to the right turn lane. So That's right, yes. My question is, um, you mentioned there might be some reduction of parking. Does that include the um, the new frontage along 408 Mission, maybe up to 418 Mission, so that one can enter the right turn lane? Um, it, it likely would. Yes, there would be, uh, you know, if you can see there, um, the way it's set up is that there's that, uh, there's basically a bike, um, a bike lane that, um, becomes a, a dashed, uh, green, it's not shown here, but it would be a dashed green crossing area for cars to enter into the right lane. Um, so for around 422, uh, mission, you can probably still maintain um, parking, but the cars that you see there in front of 408 Mission probably couldn't uh, exist right there. So you'd lose parking there. Um, you'd likely also lose parking um, just north of what it says estate planning webinar blog there. Um, you don't see any cars there right now, but there's a, a couple parking spots that are um, just north of that white building along uh, Mission Street. Okay, thank you. And um, I think I had seen a preview of this some months back. And again, I want to thank you for uh, for showing it to me and for uh, finessing it as you have. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing I'll point out here is that, uh, you know, one reason to segregate this project, obviously, is a much more elaborate design. But um, in looking, if we were to look at a warrant analysis for the mission in Pasadena um, intersection, and whether you know a stop sign is is warranted in each direction um, is unknown. It's not this idea with that we had is we might want to cover during this uh, project, um, since we're doing all this configuration work. I do. Thank, thank you. you um, thank you, Ted. I have. Do you have more to your presentation? If I, I do, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I have questions on all of the projects. So maybe I'll let you finish. Sure, no problem. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So um Do you have a question, Diego? And oh talk? yeah. Oh, oh we okay. Okay. So uh the next slide is a really a, a total reiteration of what we talked about um previously. This is really just showing um the example program in Burbank where uh they have divided their city up into areas. And there's even sub areas within the areas, um, and the idea is that they're they're organizing rehabilitation into areas. So I don't want to belabor that too much. I think we've talked about that enough. I just didn't want to get too far away from what we've talked about in the past. Um, and there's advantage to this, uh, and how you can plan out your streets. So let me uh, let's jump to the next slide. And so this is the area map. Um, that were provided you uh, previously. I don't know if we had marked every street on here that we have now, um, but what we've done is we've sort of both um, scientifically and artistically divided the city up into seven areas. Um, and the idea here is that we're focusing um, on non-arterial streets. So these are this is a residential street improvement program, which is many of the complaints that you hear and, and we hear with regard to getting streets improved. And the idea behind that is arterial streets are kind of on their own pathway. We have uh, money coming through for Fremont, Huntington. Um, we have a current project on Fair Oaks. And so the idea is that the arterial streets kind of have their own pathway of funding and um, need their own construction management plan. Um, where the arterial streets really need non-arterial streets need to be brought together under under a comprehensive plan. And so um, the yellow lines, um, they demarcate uh, between the zones, uh, and the yellow lines could be included in a project or could not based on the need. So a good example of this is Oak Street. So you know Oak Street uh, 
could really tie in, could be added to either one of the zones that are adjacent to it, or we could leave Oak Street to its own um, project. It just really depends on how we organize that. Um, so we did for you here was we laid out the, uh, I know the colors have changed on you, so I apologize, but um, the bid package one is now the red street color. Um, bid package two is the blue street color. Um, the orange streets are ones that were recently completed. And I use the term recently kind of loosely here. Um, and then everything else that we've, that this commission has sort of talked about over time is in uh, green and purple. So um, green, solid green and solid purple, if we actually have it um, in plans that were being developed, uh, dashed green and purple if it's on one of the lists that we're talking about, but it wasn't actually on a plan. So everything should be captured here as far as streets go. Um, and again, these areas are divided up into um, uh, mostly equivalent uh, street surface area. And here, the idea is this, and it doesn't happen right away. Eventually, the city gets into a state in which it's, it's uh, rehabbing one area a year um, for a low cost for city, uh, for uh, some sort of treatment. Um, and uh, in essence, lowering the cost over time for uh, street improvements. Because once the large reconstruction efforts are underway, where we're taking streets that are completely you know, obliviated and uh, fixing them, then we regularly maintain those. Now, the key to really focusing on maintenance right now, in addition to some reconstruction, is that we, again, we've talked about this before, if we really focus our efforts on making the worst streets better uh, and we don't um, get a regular maintenance program in on the streets that are in decent condition or that we recently did, we'll lose those streets eventually too. We really need to pay attention to the streets. That's where the cost differential is going to make become um, to a point where we'll never be able, be able to overcome it, if that makes sense. Um, so again, we won't be, we probably won't be able to start this right away. And we have a couple, you know, thoughts on how we're going to strategize this that we'll talk about next. But the idea was we just start, we have one area, we do whatever reconstruction work we need to do there um, on a few streets, and then the rest get um, their treatment work. Um, now this doesn't necessarily incorporate um, water and sewer needs on this map, but as you can imagine, as I talked about earlier, it's much easier to do that on an area basis um, to make improvements that way, um, as well as other things that we need we do during street projects, uh, street lighting, signage, striping. It's easier to tie new striping patterns in in an area versus it is on one street and not on the other streets that surround it. All makes sense. Okay, so let's jump to the next slide here. Okay, so in the 2020 payment management program, um, it had a reasonable approach, which was, you know, city of South Pasadena, you tell me how much money you want to spend, and I'll tell you um, where you where you're going to spend that money based on condition, and how long it's going to take you to improve your streets over time. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that approach, um, but it really just depends on how much the city can spare to do their street improvements. Um, the approach, we're trying to take a look at that in the reverse and basically saying, what are our infrastructure needs over the long term? How can we um, uh, get enough money, money put aside to not only reconstruct the streets that need to be reconstructed, but finally maintain area by area the streets for the long term so we don't get ourselves in this situation again? Um, and so the, even though this is a good model to take a look at, we're trying to sort of reverse the perspective on this. Um, so this is what you saw a couple of years ago in 2020, which was, you know, if you're going to put three and a half million in a year, in theory, it takes this long and this much money to fix everything or, or your, or, you know, not everything, but the, the streets that it's recommending you fix in the first five years. Um, and then there's a seven year model and a 10 year model. Again, this really only about, uh, these are numbers are only reflecting pavement. 
they're not reflecting the other aspects of street reconstruction, such as concrete work, curb and gutter, sidewalks, that type of thing. Okay, let's jump to the next slide. So um, things we know about the 2020 approach. Uh, the streets that were selected and the costs that were derived in the report only took a five year look. So basically what are the worst streets? Let's program them into five years. Forget about the blue ones that were already done. And what are you gonna do? And that's what our street program was. Again, not a problem with that, but that really just is always chasing after, you know, fixing streets continually forever without improving the, the pavement condition index. The costs that were provided were based on a repair strategy. So again, not nothing wrong with that, but basically pick one street and say, um, I need concrete repair work done. It's gonna cost this much per square foot. Pick another street and I need a slurry treatment done. It's gonna cost this much per square foot. On a macro scale, that's fine to take that approach. But as we start to pick our streets and our areas, what we can do is we can go into a street and say that there's some um, real uh, problematic areas of the street that need to be dug out and patched and replaced. But overall, we might just be able to apply a, a, a treatment to the rest of the street. So if you can um, take a look at an area and sort of customize your approach to what uh, methodologies you might apply, you can get a better sense of what the cost uh, is for those streets. Like, I, I'll, And I'll just repeat. Again, it's a blanket approach that the, the payment manager plan took, and that's a good tool. But as we actually developed, we look at those specific streets that we're selecting, we can come up with better cost um, evaluation, what's going to cost in that particular bid package in an area. Um, and now another thing about the third bullet point here, there was not cost estimates provided for the other streets outside of the five-year plan in the payment management program. The reason that's important is because if we're going to um, if we're going to budget for years to come and sort of project our numbers out, um, we want to correlate uh, which streets are in the worst shape, which streets are in good shape and will decay in the next few years, and what it's gonna cost to repair those streets now versus repairing those streets later. So really, you really need to take a look at the costs for all of the streets to repair them now and make a decision based on how you're gonna um, spend that money over the next few years versus just taking the worst streets and coming up with a five-year plan to rebuild those streets um, and how much that's gonna cost. I, I kind of said a lot there, but I don't know if I'm making sense. It's really a difference between taking a snapshot of what's the worst condition and how you're gonna plan for five years versus taking an overall approach of all the streets, getting a general number of what it's gonna cost to do you know, all this work and sort of planning out that work accordingly. Okay. Um, so uh, what we don't have just yet is the new condition data. So the new 2023 pavement management program, we just finished the condition survey, our consultant did. They're going through their evaluation and we're gonna have a very shortly, we're gonna have another map to show you that heat map that shows our reds and yellows and all that kind of thing. Um, and again, since we didn't have, we only had cost data on that five year list, we don't have total cost data for the entire network just yet. And we're hoping to have that also soon. Okay, so um, let's jump to the next slide. So let's just take a look at, um, this can be a little confusing, but just take a look at um, some cost scenarios here. So if we split up all of the uh, seven areas, and again, don't let the colors confuse you, but this is the, these are the colors that refer to the different areas in the map. We didn't use numbers because we don't want there to be a number one or an A or something like that, or the best one. We want them to be sort of equivalently, um, uh, you know, fairly uh, generic. associated, generic. We want this to be apolitical. These, are, these do not align with... Uh, council member districts, for better or for worse, um, but we're using these uh, colors. So they're all about equal in terms of their square feet. And again, we're talking about non-arterial streets. So if we were to take the 2020, in quotes, five-year plan cost, 
those are the numbers that would apply to those different areas. Taking into consideration that we are not looking at all, we're not looking at the cost of all the streets in all the areas. Okay, so those are just the numbers that the consultant gave us for this, the, the worst streets, basically. Um, now, if we um, just assumed that um, the rest of the streets in the city needed only a slurry treatment, the, the cheapest type of treatment, we could come up with a theoretical uh, 2020 total cost. Okay, we're assuming the best scenario that they just have to be fixed. So you can see the numbers go up um, a bit, but not too crazy. That's basically to, to do all of the um, slurry in those areas. Uh, so the fourth column, I'm calling it the 2020 slurry only cost. So let's forget about the five-year cost scenario that the consultant gave us. Um, we're going to say that on about, I think it's 37 cents per square foot, whatever the 2020 cost for slurry was. What if we did all of the these areas in this? What if we did all the streets in that particular area, orange, purple, green, et cetera? We'd be around uh, you know, high 300s, low $400,000 would be our annual maintenance cost according to 2020. Um, now let's just jump ahead to 2023. Uh, where the slurry costs are, according to recent numbers from Los Angeles, about 57 cents per square foot. We're looking at about um, $600,000 um, for just the least amount of treatment for all the streets in that, in that area. Now, my point here is we're, we're talking about reversing our approach, right? We're not saying how much money does the city have? Let's throw it into the streets and that's what we can get. What we're showing you here is this is the minimum amount that the city has to put in on this area approach per year so that every seven years we're doing a whole area on the minimum cost uh, treatment. So you can see already it's you know six hundred thousand um, dollars. So obviously we have a lot more analysis to do and we'll talk a little bit more about this but um, we know one of our goals here is to establish um, five-year projections for the city not just according to streets but for everything for operational costs, public works, capital projects, all that type of thing. We have a separate effort going on in the city to establish these five-year projections. In that exercise, what we're hoping to do is inform you know, our financial numbers and the council about what really will it take uh, to bring the street program up to you know, an ideal standard. And that's going to mean you know, a lot of cash uh, you know, invested in the street program. That's not you know, something that is a foreign concept to anybody. Um, but in establishing those numbers, um, we set up a scenario in which perhaps the city can pursue bond uh, financing. Um, we can establish baselines for development costs, like you said, and set up a development funded program, um, whether it's on, you know, we can go as far as to set up an assessment program of the city, much like we do for landscaping and lighting. So we don't really have a, a solution established here. But the idea here is coming up with these appropriate baselines for a reoccurring maintenance program over time, uh, in addition to what the actual reconstruction costs are. And that's all this slide is showing. Um, so what's TBD in the last column is the 2023, what we'll call the total costs. Because once we have the condition data, the new condition data from the consultant, and we have cost estimates um, for the you know, streets that need more love, that need reconstruction work, then we can have an accurate view of what the actual costs are to improve each of these areas and whether that's gonna refine our other, this area approach. So we have more to, more to say on this, but I'll, I'll pause here for a second just in case there's any questions. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, you show a significant rise in the slurry only costs when you go from 2020 to 2023. When I look at your unit costs at the bottom of the page, it virtually indicates that there's a 50% increase in cost in three years. Why so high? Um, many reasons. Uh, we're actually seeing that now in our current street improvement project. Um, 
we, you know, ran into a scheduling problem the other day and we were able to solve it. But if we hadn't, um, we would be, one of our streets would have been delayed a couple months and we would have been looking at a, a very significant asphalt increase. Um, the, um, you know, the, for lack of a better term, my understanding here is, and I'm not an expert, but from being involved in trying to resolve this, we understand that um, the, uh, the market dynamic between you know asphalt producers and asphalt delivery uh you know truck drivers basically has shifted um and so you know there's a lot more volatility in terms of the cost of asphalt um there's delays on equipment there's you know labor increases there's a there's inflation there's just there's there's just many different reasons um so uh you know the the, the we feel the numbers are the numbers are based on a, a um, numbers reported from the Los Angeles area from our consultant, um, but there's a lot of basis to support why those in, those increases have happened just over the last three years. Um, and the 2020 costs um, might not necessarily represent the year 2020. They might represent like 2019. So it, there's also might be like pre-COVID, pre, you know, um, supply uh issues also supply chain issues so yeah the the numbers have significantly increased um so other notes on this page um yeah i think we went through everything here as, as we were explaining it um so let me jump to the next slide show you another sort of way to look at this so um if we were to uh, you know, change our approach slightly here. We're still looking at the same um, seven areas, same square footage. But if we were to take a look at the 2020 pavement condition index numbers and break down um, what square footage per area was in which condition category. So for the example, for area orange area, 1.2 million square feet, we can divide that 1.2 million square feet into four different, I'm sorry, five different conditions. Very poor, poor, fair, good, and very good, which each could correspond to our zero to 100 pavement condition rate. Um, so in theory, streets that are fair, good, and very good, yellow, green, and blue, basically, um, are candidates for the least expensive treatment option. That makes sense, right? It's it's only our very poor and our poor streets that need a lot of uh, cash to be injected in them to fix them. So in theory, if yellow, green, and blue are the areas that we can do um, slurry treatment now and save those streets from turning orange or turning red, we may want to do as many of those streets as possible to avoid the high costs of red and um, orange. because you know, as you saw on the last slide, um, where slurry treatments are, you know, 57 cents a square foot, for reconstruction, they're, you know, dollars a square foot. They're much more expensive. Um, so, you know, in, in deciding which area, you know, we basically start with, um, it may make sense to start with the most impactful area where we can make, we can put money in today um, that will save us money, more money in the future. So, for example, the orange area, the um, south uh, eastern part of the city has got, you know, uh, three quarters of a million uh, square foot that could be a good candidate um, for slurry. Now, again, for my earlier comment about, you know, the sort of blanket approach to treatments based on pavement condition index, we have to look at what's actually going on in that street to see if it's a good candidate. We've seen other instances in the pavement management plan where um, a pavement condition might be okay, but the curbs are completely broken. And so it might make sense to go back and actually fix the concrete and then we're doing more work on that street. Um, we've seen other instances where the pavement's in terrible condition but the street really hasn't subsided that much. There's not really that many dig outs or depressions. And so 
you know, the foundation of the street isn't really in that bad shape. So we might be able to do less work on that really than having to dig it out. Um, so it really takes a sort of a custom approach to take a look at all the streets and, and figure this out. But if we were to take this area approach, um, this is one way to take a look at it. So, you know, um, what we're talking about here is, uh, and I'll go back, let's go back to the, um, now, can you go back to the map of all the areas? This one, yes. So we're really trying to incorporate um, an approach that takes care of a couple things. So let's just take the orange area, for example. And I'm not suggesting that that's the one we're doing. It's just the one we're sort of talking about as an example. Um, the orange area incorporates a couple orange streets, meaning they were recently completed. It has a couple blue streets, ones that are in the next bid package. It has a couple green streets that were already selected. Um, for slurry treatment. So, um, you know, in a future approach, uh, it would make sense to sort of, um, you know, do all the, the streets in a single area and, and take care of all the problems in that one area um, and then move on to a, another area. So we have a couple factors we have to consider here. We have to consider the cost of the water and sewer utility improvements and if they, you know, need to happen in an area like this. Um, what are the reconstruction efforts that need to happen? Um, and then are these streets really good candidates for a low cost uh, treatment? And so that's our that's where we're headed right now. So as we get the, the 2023 pavement condition data in, and we take a look at streets in particular to see if they um, match up with what our treatment expectations are, if a, if a street's in the, you know, fair to good range, can it accept a slurry treatment and that would be a good um, use of our money. Um, what we're thinking is going to happen is our, over the next one or two cycles, we'll probably get into this area approach. It could be that um, we have, uh, we may be able to do uh, a good part of one area under the next year um, where we also have to focus our efforts in other places in the city. Um, and not actually get into a full area approach for another, you know, two, three years. Or it could be that we find that, yeah, the area approach makes sense. We're going to do some reconstruction projects and some um, treatment projects, slurry treatment projects in one area, and you know, fix up the water system in that area over that, uh, that project as best as we can. So, you know, we don't have a, uh, there's no silver bullet, and we don't have an answer for you tonight. We just really wanted to share with you the thinking and take this a step further than when we last discussed the evaluation that we're doing. The next step with you is to bring back that condition data, show you what our evaluation has found, and basically spit out a recommendation for what our slurry project should be this coming uh, late spring, summer. Um, what we're doing now is basically developing a generic bid package for treatments that doesn't incorporate complicated designs. And we basically list streets um, and make a lot of the work done on a field assessment. Basically, everything's broken down by quantities in the bid package, and then it really doesn't matter which streets are selected according to the way the bid package is set up. It's all just broken down as far as quantities go. It's a little bit different than um, a reconstruction project because we have to show concrete design standards, striping plans, and stuff like that, um, which, you know, of course, we could do under a, a, a treatment project, but it wouldn't have to do, wouldn't have to be a whole, you know, complete bid package, if that kind of makes sense. So... So that's where we are. Um, let me jump ahead next to our, our last couple slides here. I think it's the next one. Yes. So um, what we're talking about uh, tonight is, you know, completing the condition survey, which we've done, identifying these priority areas based on these collective factors we've talked about. Um, we're talking to you about this tonight. We had a very, uh, a much more abbreviated presentation for the Public Works Commission last week because um, they haven't been as involved as this commission has in the street process. We're really just sharing the, the high-level methodology with that commission. Um, and the next is really about um, coming back to the commission with a plan. Uh, and then uh, the keys are really financing. I mean, the that's the bottom line is um, how do we come up with, we have a plan, how do we, how do we fund it? And so that's where we've had um, some very serious conversations with finance, and we'll have to have those with council also about um, 
putting money into this project through those various uh, pathways we talked about. Um, so that's a lot, but uh, hopefully it gives you an idea where we are um, and uh, happy to discuss or take questions. I do have a question about like, um, sort of like how this could possibly coincide with any further developments down the line. I understand that these are estimates. So I guess my um, question is like, um, how likely is it that this could coincide with something like um, kind of like the other projects that are being proposed as well? I guess like I'm thinking about like the tool group um, as well as like some of the other projects like the one that you showed earlier, like how much of this can like coincide or like change down the line? Sure, it's a good question. Um... So, you know, we're, tr we're really trying to find a balanced approach here where we're taking on enough factors that it's a really robust process, but we also understand that we can't solve all of the problems all at once, you know, otherwise we'll never get anything done. And so we're, we're try in our minds, we're trying to segregate some of those projects out as like arterial major projects um, and sort of take on this sort of simpler approach for street design. Now, understanding that we may want to do some striping and safety reconfigurations on streets, residential streets as we do this, similar to what we're doing with school design. Um, if we're able to sort of set up this, um, the interval of streets years ahead um, and basically lock in the financing for those streets years ahead. So it's not like we run into a budget year and it's a crisis and we have to defund everything we're doing and we get behind. That really gives us an opportunity to have some time in the design uh, pipeline to do some of this more um, thoughtful work in terms of reconfiguring a street. Right. If I know what residential streets I'm doing in three years, and you know, under the last, we knew that in our last plan, but it wasn't really supported by a financial model, I can safely say, okay, let's spend some time really considering what those streets are going to look like. So my design is ready to build in three years. Right. Does that help? Yeah, it's yeah. just very complex, so it's just like, you know, I'm sure that's a lot to deal with, so. It is, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, no, that's fine. You can leave it up. Or actually, maybe we'll take it down and have the uh, commissioners on video. Yeah, okay. Ted, on the issue of uh, conventional resurfacing versus slurry seal, uh, my understanding is that, in general, Streets are resurfaced every 20 to 30 years, but resurfacing, I'm sorry, but slurry should occur about every four or five years. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. I mean, we I think we're kind of pushing it to like seven year model, which is why we had the seven um, year plan so that, uh, you know, streets that um, based on condition really met the threshold for needing some complete work done because yeah they're not going to last forever um the the hope is that um you know we can uh be doing work in each of those areas um do work in one of those areas every year and that would incorporate um all types of projects so over time um, whether we're doing a, a traditional um, resurfacing project versus a treatment project, uh, they sort of even out inside the area. So in other words, um, you know, some streets are going to wear faster than others are going to be exposed to different sort of conditions inside the area. But in general, the thought is that um, you're spending the same amount of money uh, each year to do your street work. Is that, so so yeah. if a uh, street is in good condition, the thought is that you want to keep it in good condition, so you slurry it after year, at year seven, and then does that imply you slurry again at year 14? Yes, um, unless you know, you're, for some reason or another, there's more work to do on that street. Um, you know, you've bought yourself you're you're buying yourself time so that that street is in good condition probably in, in year seven through to year 14 but if it needs additional work that a slurry just can't handle you also do that work in year 14 
so that it doesn't fall um, so far in disarray that it's going to cost a lot of money in year 14. So in good condition, you slurry at year seven, you slurry at year 14, maybe at year 20, you're ready to resurface. Again. Yeah, maybe at year 21, you're ready yeah. to resurface. The only yeah. reason why I raised that is in my time here living in the city, maybe I'm wrong with my observations, but I just haven't seen the second slurry come after a few years. It's like the street is slurried and then it's forgotten until it's resurfaced. Yeah, and, and that's what we expect. That's what we think will can be corrected, and, and then there can be an overall cost savings over time. It's not this program isn't for the patient, uh, or is, is for the patient, I should say. In that, um, you know, we we want to with that one slide where we showed, you know, the minimum treatment cost for the entire city is like six hundred thousand dollars at a minimum, or for the entire area, six hundred thousand dollars at a minimum you know, 4.4 million for the whole city is to reiterate that idea is that that second slurry project, you know, should occur essentially. Okay. So there's yeah. going to be some sort of uh, accounting or recording of uh, the, the uh, slurry application so that you'll know, Hey, we, we slurried the street in year seven, but it's year 14. We need to go back there. Because it doesn't appear that's happened in the past. It hasn't happened in the past. And so I would say there's an accounting for it. There's also an evaluation that, you know, on an area approach, you can say, you know, the orange area or the green area is coming up in three years. Um, okay. What is the condition of these streets? Are we going to be able to do a slurry on all these streets? What needs to be re, we can rebuilt? What's, our, what's the situation? And the hope is that if you're doing this regularly every seven years, whatever you're looking at is not going to be that bad. It's, it's not going to be a huge cost um, for repair. And you've got other work that's happening anyway. I mean, utility companies are cutting, coming through, cutting things up. Um, you know, you have, you may have other uh, issues in the street. Um, you know, there's going to be other things that happen that are out of, outside of the model that are going to impact what happens every seven years in that area. Okay. Second issue um, on the colored areas or zones that you've identified that implies that for a given fiscal year the work will be confined for uh, neighborhood streets to that zone is that correct in theory that's how the model would work eventually understanding that it might take some years to get into that model so like for example in 2025 we may be doing a large portion of one zone, but also picking up streets in a couple other areas just because, um, you know, out of out of need. So it's hard it's hard to start this approach right away. Well, but you expect to get in sync by year two or three, correct? I mean that that's the I that's the hope. Like for example, if if this if the numbers work out, we could after we finish. Um, Packages two, three, and four. Uh, so let's say they would finish 2024 projects. In theory, in 2025, we could just start with one area. Um, now, that might mean a particular, under that model, it might mean a particular street, which is particularly bad. Say it's got like a, you know, a five or a 10 PCI score. In theory, we might not get to it for another seven years that might be unacceptable. So it might be that we have to do, you know, somewhere between 70 and a hundred percent of a, of a, of a color area and still have uh, funding available for these streets that are just can't wait for seven years. Okay. So yeah. we have a uh, seven zones uh, that implies a seven year cycle so far so good, but yet we're considering other cycles of five years or 10 years and that would seem to throw it off. It it does initially. I mean, because it's, it's just very hard for us to move right into a new um, plan. Um, and again, some of it depends on um, what that budget model is going to look like. It may be that this is just too much to ask. Uh, when we get the total cost numbers back for a particular area, it might be, you know, that that area costs $3 million to do both the reconstruction projects and the um, 
slurry treatment projects. And for some reason, we can only do 2.6. And so that would throw the model off too. But the idea is that eventually, if you stick to it and you're injecting enough money, you will be able to account, you will be able to move into the seven year model. Okay, thank you. That's all. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Hughes. Thank you, Ted. Uh, terrific presentation, very informative. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll start sort of high level and then drill down. So historically, the way we worked on these streets or these lists is staff would come to the commission with a proposal, PCP scores and um, various information, and we'd come up with a list of proposed streets. Um, and that would go to council, typically those would be approved and they would move forward. Um, I think the last year was, was it 2019, 2020? Was that the last fiscal year that we sort of had that approach and came up with a list of streets or? I think there might've been a 2021 list. And then when we um, did the 21, 22 list, we kind of re, listed streets that were on previous lists. So we're playing catch up. Yes, still. exactly. Yeah. Okay. So as we move towards the next budget cycle, and I and I very much support this zonal approach. I think it's terrific. But like as you said, it's not tomorrow. It I'm trying to get a picture of what's going to happen fiscal year 24, 25. Are we still working on the catch up projects went through four, or is, are there going to be additional streets that can be either repaved or slurried on top of what you're currently working on? Or no, we'll still be in catch up mode. Our hope is to be uh, so in this calendar year, our hope is to be through all four of these projects. Um, so, yeah, in 24 25, there will be still some catch up because we're only five months, five and a half months away from the beginning of that year. And, um, you know, really the best time to do the slurry project would be like late spring, early summer. So that kind of puts it there. And we know that we won't be able to take on, you know, we don't, we prefer not to take on Mission Arroyo Pasadena until um, we've gotten project two and project three done. So that's probably put it into the early 24, 25 fiscal year. But, you know, the hope is to have all this done right 2024. So in 2025, it's a new set of reconstruction projects and a new set of um, treatment projects. Okay. And how yeah. will those be selected? That's what we want to come back here with our 2023 data and uh, vet with you. So same process that you're used to. Staff develops a list, comes to you for a review, goes to council for approval. That's how our SB1 funding works um you know that's how you know council uh has an opportunity to weigh in on how we're doing going about it the difference is how we make that selection um what we understand the process to have been in the past was that we actually literally get the pavement management program report say okay this is what it says here you go um this is the streets that's getting recommended what we're doing now is saying okay we're taking this we're going to do a lot more analysis. We've got water, sewer, street, um, future funding, you know, efficiencies to work out, um, maybe some safety issues in certain streets. And now this is what we're going to recommend to the commission to pass on to council. Okay. So, um, so, you know, we have a SB1 resolution due in July. Um, we should really you know, by May or so have discussion in that with this commission so that we're committing 24, 25 funding, you know, for new streets but that should be built in 24, 25. Okay. Yeah. Um, and as we're catching up on the prior approved list of streets in those fiscal years, as those projects were being approved was funding set aside at that time for these projects or how does that work? Because for example, the, the 2018, 2019 list that was approved cost a certain amount of money at that time. And now clearly is costing appreciably more. So how does that work? So I, it's hard to understand how it worked previously. 
um, because uh, our understanding was that the city kind of had a capital improvement program. Um, and so uh, street money might have been put into a bucket. But then when the actual street contracts were awarded to council, they were kind of appropriate at that time. So that might not have aligned with what was adopted in the budget. Um, so there's one aspect of it. Um, what we've done this last year and a half or so is um, a, something a little bit similar where we just basically put all of the money that we were aware that we had into one big pile. And that's how we basically figured out what well, we can probably get these four projects done with this amount of money. Um, what we would ideally like to do in the future is that um, we understand the, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, the approximate cost of what the streets are going to be in these next couple of years with an estimate about what we can project, you know, the cost of labor and everything to be barring some, you know, crazy inflation scenario, which is, again, that's that we can see that can happen. Um, and then do our, you know, budget projection based on that. So, um, so it, it, it probably doesn't sound like, uh, um, anything different than what you'd expect, but I, I guess what I, if I were to compare it to what we've done in the past, in the past, um, there was money set aside by the council, but it was based on how much money do we want to throw into streets this year. My, that's my understanding. Versus this is what this year is going to cost according to our plan. Have we budgeted that much according to our plan? Right. So I don't think that that those really have aligned, and that's not anybody's fault. It's just there wasn't that mechanism. Sure. Obviously. Sure. And yeah. So so to that point. As you were talking about, uh, I think it's Project Four, which is the Mission Pasadena Arroyo Stony um, segment. Um, that I believe was originally 2018, 2019, and one of the reasons we proposed it at that time was because of the challenges at that intersection generally, and the stop sign in, in, uh, specifically, which I think quarterly is knocked down, if not more frequently. Um, so I'm the the plan that you showed us tonight is that different than the plan that you showed us within the last six seven eight months it was basically the same it's concept. essentially the same i think we made some tweaks to it because um uh we i think one of the if we made any changes it was because um of the analysis that we think that we expect we should do at mission um and pasadena that you know, that probably deserves to be some sort of a controlled intersection. Um, so I think, I don't know if this um, exactly reflects it, and it might not, this is the image that we might not have off the current drawings, I think it's close enough, that sort of incorporated the fact that um, there might be at least stop signs of that, uh, that intersection. Well, I'm yeah. glad you're looking at it as yeah. some kind of control, because I think it could certainly use it. Um, so just tying back to the financing from a moment ago, so when we first talked about it, it was going to be, re I think, it, I don't know if it's asphalt or cement or a combination of both it's, there. Yeah, it's concrete um, with probably some concrete. asphalt over it, yeah. Um, that it would be repaved and then some kind of an island put in to protect essentially the stop. Obviously, this is a much grander plan um, and much, much improved. The funding for this, does it exist? Because this is a much bigger project than what was anticipated. So... My concern is, do we have the funding for it? Um, do we know how much it's going to cost? Do we have the funding for it? Um, is it, I don't want to use the term pie in the sky, but is it something that's not attainable or achievable near term, or is it something that we're, we're able to do? Sure. Um, so it's a good question. Um, we don't have the exact cost in this yet because our consultants, you know, has to establish what those costs are. They haven't done that for us yet on this newest design. Um, whether we have the funding, we think we do because um, this current project that we're doing is going to cost us about uh, one point two million dollars. So we set aside about three point eight total. It's going to cost about one point two million dollars, maybe one point three, given all the other kind of things we've had to do for consultants and help and stuff like that. Um, the next um, projects uh, will probably have us may have a similar cost. Um, it'll be 
a little bit different because of the water and sewer um, cash sources that come into play uh, that would be can be used for those improvements. And you have to kind of um, be careful how you draw the line between spending street money and, and uh, utility improvements. Um, the slurry project costs can grow and shrink based on how much funding is available. So like if we want to, we're, we're hoping to, we think it's a good idea to actually do as much of that treatment work as possible to save money in the future. But, um, you know, out of that about $4 million pot, I think we assumed we would probably spend about $400,000 or so. Um, now that's the current money that's set aside. We have a capital reserve agreement sort of on the table for money, um, metro money that we didn't spend that we kind of saved at the last second to sort of use it for streets. Um, we are, you know, the SB1 situation is a little interesting because the city um, never really met its MOE over time um, because it was never really, it's, it, we're supposed to spend $1.4 million a year in order to get what was about four or $500,000 a year from the state. And we, it would always take us a little over a year to spend that money in streets. So we never actually, you know, really got there. So the accounting of that and how much money we actually have available versus how much money um, we can't use because we didn't make the MOE is a little bit confusing. Um, we do know that we'll, we've already met that MOE this year, but the project we just did. And so we have, you know, um, a year in the bag of SB1 money coming to us from the money that we just spent. So we do think that we've got that money there, but I can't say for certain because we kind of have to figure out all these moving parts and then do the projection um, with all the other uh, needs the city has on whether um, we're going to have the same amount of money coming in 2025, 26 that we had, say, from the general fund um, for uh, these projects. So, yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're only... We're, we're confidently moving forward with these projects, thinking that the fund, the construction funding will be there for the next few years. It's a little bit more of a question mark. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. All right. I'll, it, it sounds like there's reason for hope and that, yes. Okay. Yeah. These are achievable. A couple more questions that are quick and then I'll stop. Um, the slurry uh, graphic that you, that you shared, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually the, the graphic entitled proposed projects. Let's see here. Oh, sorry, proposed areas with, with the seven different zones. And you put on there the draft street maintenance zones. Some are solid colors, some are dotted. Yes. Or dashed. Um, so a couple of things. Yeah, uh, thank you. So two quick questions, I think, on this. The, well, I'll wait till you get there. It's the map of all the there it is. So the dashed um, segments, where did those come from? Were those also on some list? Yes. This, okay. So um what we broke these down just be you know, try to keep everything organized, but um the green ones, whether they're dashed or solid, were on the preventative maintenance list. Um, lists from, you know, either a staff list, the commission's list that was approved from the staff, yeah. or the or the council adopted SP one list. So somehow it was on the list. This is the slurry list, preventative maintenance at eighteen, nineteen, and nineteen and twenty. That's probably these. Um, the only difference between the solid and dash is that um, staff started drafting a actual plan set drawings of the streets um, and the dash ones that are on that list. Well, the dash ones on the map that are on that list, were not in the plan set. It doesn't matter because we don't really need that plan set. Like I said, we're taking a new approach to that. It doesn't make sense for us to slurry a street and draft plans to slurry the street. What we really need is just like standards, quantities, and, you know, specifications for what we want done. Everything else happens in the field. We go out and we 
literally circle curbs with white or circle areas with orange that we want to be dug out and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's not, it makes it slower to develop a plan set. So I, I would ignore the difference between green and, or solid green and dash green on this map. It was just to sort of track all the different lists and concepts of street collections that were out there in the world. Okay, so as we sit here, what streets are slate, or is that what you're still working on? What streets are slated? What streets are slated for slurry work, or do we, are we not? That's, I mean, yeah, nothing yet. That's okay. project three. Nothing slated. If I were to just to make you know, for I would give you an example scenario. If we did, if we went with the orange zone, you would capture the green streets that were already on the list. And you'd capture, um, according to the 2020 numbers, the largest area set of slurry candidates in the city. So that might be a, a suggestion, but we don't have all the information for 2023 yet. So that, that could change. Okay. Yeah. So just a specific comment on a specific segment, not in the orange zone, in the red sure. zone. Yeah. Uh, you'll see that there's a segment of grand from Hermosa to, I think it's the city limit. Mm -hmm. North City Limit, that's, uh, I think it's in purple. Um, I think that's the color I'm seeing. Um, so 30 years ago, we um, clarified with staff that that should actually go to Paloma, which is about a block or so south. Um, and it's not reflected here. And it's every time we talk about it, it comes up. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure whenever it is you get to the red zone, first, last, somewhere in between, that we make sure that we're clear on the segment. And, and the reason for that is the street condition, it, the ch there's a change around Paloma. And the condition north of there to the city limit is identical. Mm -hmm. And then south of there, it changes. So it's, Hermosa isn't sort of the magic dividing line. It's actually a little bit south. So I just wanted to make sure that doesn't get lost because it seems to. Yeah, of course. And so, you know, as I, um, so to your point on our previous, on our previous pavement management or plan, um, we only had treatment suggested for the first five years of expenditures. Um, what would be helpful for us now, and we're trying to working this out with our consultant, um, is to look at if we were to do all the streets in the city at this moment, what would be the treatments that would apply? And that will help us decide like how to sort of cost the whole thing out. So it might be appropriate for us to show you like what's the treatment from Hermosa to Paloma today that's recommended. Um, and that might help us make that decision. Um, but no, I, I, I see exactly what you mean. Um, you know, and to the point of it may be too soon to go by an area by area approach, um, you know, one of our, uh, I say exit strategy in the Solar Streets program might have been to slurry grand. Um, and that's not off the table, depending, depending on how we move forward with um, the Solar Streets program. But there's many streets that have um, needs that might not, may not be able to wait till we get to that street. For example, there's you know a couple locations where we've had sinkholes. And so we've done temporary repairs on those sinkholes. It might make sense to actually come back through and do some more work on those uh, street surfaces. We've had water breaks that we've done temporary patching on. Um, so there could be some streets on this map that we may have to go outside of our area approach because um, if we wait to do those, they're going to have much larger, much more expensive problems. Right. And, so, and I think a zone by zone approach with some flex makes a lot of sense. Last question. I appreciate it, Vice Chair. You mentioned probably an hour ago, <laughs> we were talking about project one, you said the Monterey, you talked about the Monterey Road street lamps and, and you said new. Are, are you talking about the actual, just the lamp itself? Yeah, we're just it's, talking about the heads uh, that get replaced with new LEDs. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, not the whole thing, okay. unless they're broken or and something. And is that like something, we're, is that an approach we're taking on streets as we improve them that we're changing out the, the lamps? That's our approach. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's a good portion of the city uh, where those are owned by Edison in which we're not able to do that, but when they're city owned, we can we can do that. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, on the note of Edison, there was a program where they were changing out their their lamps that they own and run. They are. It's just LED that we and more energy efficient. 
Yes, and they are. It's just that it's a it's a different approach versus us changing out our lamps versus them changing out their lamps. So these are ones that are ours, and we'll change them out as part of this project. Thanks, Ted. A couple questions. One, you had we had um, alluded to the list of projects that were originally on the 18, 19, 19, 20, and you shared that some of them though have fallen off the list from for various reasons. So, is there a way that we could get at some point a a list to correlate which ones have gone away permanently or <laughs> fell off or that we know so that we know that information? Well, let, let me reiterate that um, our understanding is that this map captures all of the projects that were on a list. If you do see something that is um, not, we should talk about that because I, I think we tried to make sure this incorporated everything. I think you shared early when we asked if Pine Street fell off. So, so Pine Street's on there. It's in it's in blue. It's part of um, bid package two. If you see it on the map, uh, it's uh, if I could point to it, it's like just to the right of the word pink. Okay. So when I asked earlier, you said it fell off. So it it, it probably fell guy. off. Uh, I think it fell off the eighteen nineteen list and landed on the nineteen twenty list. Okay. Yeah. So we feel comfortable that everything that had been planned for eighteen nineteen nineteen twenty. It's being incorporated into the projects, one or two or what have you. Well, let me well let me reiterate. So, um, what's red and blue on this map, and I know that's confusing <laughs> because there's big words that say red and blue, but I'm talking about the streets that are either red or blue. Um, those are in a project. If they're orange, in theory, they were already done. Okay. If they're green or blue green or purple, they're on a list, a previous list, they may not be on a, on, a, on, a, on a new project because it may be that we've reprioritized um, on an area approach or for some other reason and those streets maybe not are not on the list. Okay. Any, on so the I'll, I'll go back now okay. to this map and double check. Sure. Make sure. And then you mentioned the slurry list. So we have what was the slurry Recommend, recommended streets for 18, 19, and 19, 20. Which should be green and purple on this map. Which um, tentatively, though, these were in, this was back in the condition when we thought we could slurry these. So I don't know if these are still at that stage. And that's a very good point. That, the condition of the streets, because I also have the, the PCI list but this was the 1718 um, analysis. So then all of this is in worse condition. Yes. So, you know, the what we call the 2015 PMP and the 2020 PMP, they both had these five year plans. Um, and if I were to show you all the Excel table behind all of this, you'd see that we've got those listed as five year plans. In fact, if you, um, Leanna, if you don't mind going to uh, a couple of slides down. Um, one more. That you're, yeah, you're right going here. back and analyzing the slurry so that what might be on this slurry might still be applicable, but then you're going to analyze what everything needs to be for possibly. Yeah, I mean, what we're doing region. now is, is, is really all we, what we've done is just recondition the entire city. We've just reevaluated all the streets to see what condition they're in now for, for better or for worse. So like, for example, the 2020, um, what the, the second column there uh, that says 2020 five-year plan cost, that is off your 2020 PMP list. That's the, pl that's the streets that the consultant recommended are done in 2020, including both reconstruction, slurry, Cape Seal. Um, and we... Um, we're not representing that five-year plan anywhere except for on this cost evaluation because that five-year plan may or may not have landed into your 18, 19, 19, 20 um, slurry list. Okay. I'm assuming it did because I don't see that's, I think that's how the staff did it. They just basically took the plan and put it on the list, but we're, we're really not reevaluating the 2015 or the 2020 PMP. 
but you're starting with the new analysis. So you will come back to us with information about slurry recommendation. Exactly. I was showing you the 2020 analysis just so you can understand the cost and how we're going about it. But we really need to update this table with the new information. It wouldn't make sense to base the decision on. If I recall, and help me, fellow commissioners, there was a presentation that we received a number of years ago where I believe the analysis to, to redo everything we need to do was in the $80 million range. So that. You and know. it had been looked at similarly where there was a. You know, how much you needed to put in a year and where you would you would front load or back load the costs and the budgets. And going back to the budget issue, which um, Commissioner Abelson, that we had, as our understanding was that there was a capital account that included the money that was allocated for street improvements. And it also was not to be zeroed out at the end of the year. It was a cumulative that you know, if you didn't finish, it was there and would carry over and you'd add this next year because as you were saying, you need design, construction, et cetera. But where that all blew up and if it did. So I'll say a couple of things. Um, I think that the 2020 PMP total needs was way less than that. And the reason was because it only considered pavement condition. It didn't consider other aspects of reconstruction like concrete work. Um, the 80 million might have come from um, another, I'm not sure where that number came from, but it, there's been a couple numbers that have been close to that as far as like other infrastructure needs in the city. Um, now, as far as the street CIP account, um, there was basically one account that was set up for all street related stuff. Um, and it was referenced all over the place. It got access during the Fair Oaks ITS project. Um, it got access during, um, you know, our other street improvement projects. Um, you know, somehow it got associated with the Rogan money at some point. So uh, I don't know, you know, that the, the, there wasn't a very stringent accounting of that. Um, we think we've now cleaned it up. We have a very specific account number for the street projects we're working on right now. And that will be even probably split up even further for the next few years associated with actual um, street named projects. Um, so yeah, it, it's a little bit confusing. Um, and it's been very confusing for both our team and the finance team to sort of sort that out. As long as we kind of look at the long term, but I, I, yeah. you were mentioning that we should be anticipating you coming back at least by May, if not sooner. Hopefully so sooner, that yeah. we can then plan and approve it and recommend for the next fiscal about the dollar and what's needed. That's what our hope is. So we want to kind of get this, um, you know, I apologize, but tedious conversation out of the way. So you had a good basis for what we we're talking about when we, when we showed you everything else. Any other questions? Um, just a quick little question about the design from the um, design over at Mission and Pasadena Avenue. If we can take a look at that real quick. Of course. Um, so I see that there is a slip lane right here. And I guess my, just like one thing that I wanted to kind of ask, like, is there a possibility that instead of a yield that could be a like stop sign or maybe like somehow because I, I I understand that there's a little bit more um, talk about how like slip lanes can often lead to um, their own sort of pedestrian safety concerns, but um, I don't I don't know like I, I think that overall this this like design is is also just very efficient. It seems very um, it seems like a really good use of space, but I think that that's like the one thing that really does um, stick out to me. Yeah, and, and so you're talking about traveling uh, westbound on mission. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, and so that that was our thought too, was that uh, the that intersection could be controlled. Uh, so our thought is, and we're looking for, you know, advisement on this from the commission to actually initiate a a warrant analysis for the stop sign at that location that can inform this design um, to complete it that way. Right. 
I guess like my concerns more specifically like the slip lane itself um as it as it does sort of like I feel have its own sort of safety concern like that where the where it turns into onto um northbound going on Arroyo Drive Oh um oh I see what you mean okay I'm sorry yeah, yeah so uh the yield over there yeah. um yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we we discussed if there was a if it made sense to have like a separate um, cycle area there. Um, ultimately, um, in this particular iteration of the design, we thought that vehicles should be moving fairly slowly through this whole configuration, so it should be easy for cyclists to sort of share the space. But if you have a different thought on um, how we can configure that differently for cyclists to move through that. Um, but my concern isn't yeah. necessarily with like cyclists per se, but more so like pedestrians, like crossing. Oh, okay. So that's a really good point. So that's why it's hard to see because the, the, the white crosswalk is still there under right. the image. Right. We've actually moved that crosswalk South. Mm -hmm. um, so the crosswalk um, in theory, there shouldn't be anybody crossing in front of that yield. They should have crossed, um, you know, it's hard to see, it's hard for me to point to it here for you, but um, south of the yield, you see that that new crosswalk along where there's a green belt and a pathway. Um, so there shouldn't, in theory, there wouldn't be anybody crossing the street near where that yield is. I They'd see. be crossing um, below that. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, Ted, let's just go through one example. Let's assume we're in our third or fourth year of the cycle. We're in sync now. We've got uh, seven zones. We recycle every seven, seven years. We have a five-year capital improvement program. So let's just take the orange zone, for example. Um, the colored streets have been taken care of. So now we want to consider the black streets. Uh, as to which ones should be uh, in in that program for that year. So as you look at the black streets that haven't had a project, uh, what would you do? Say any street under PCI of 40 is programmed for uh, an improvement? Um, uh, that would be a really high level way to look at it. What we would probably do is we'd, we'd look at each specific street we'd see if um, the street needs. So for example, um, in the case of Alta Vista, for example, we've had to grind down a couple inches. Um, we haven't had much to dig out and repair as far as the street foundation goes, because um, there actually was a lot of asphalt in Alta Vista. Whereas for Monterey, um, there were some dig out areas that had to be rebuilt uh, and then sort of temporarily patched even before we came through with the grind. So we would go on each street individually and see what its needs were so that we probably had to, let's say we had to reconstruct 25% um, of the streets that are in that zone. So that's probably, you know, that might cost at that time $2 million. Um, and then to do a treatment on the rest of the streets in that zone would cost, you know, seven, six, six, seven hundred thousand $700,000. So that year we're gonna to have to spend, you know, close to three million dollars to finish that zone, um, so that it's ready for another cycle to hopefully only cost what the twenty um, thirty equivalent of seven hundred six hundred thousand dollars is today, if if that makes sense. But, but I don't know what you mean by finish that zone. Does it mean only a few of the select black streets there, or does it mean? all the remaining streets. It would mean all the remaining streets. It would mean that you reconstruct what needs to be reconstructed. Um, and the, uh, it would, you know, in theory, it's a percentage of what's in that zone. Um, and then the rest receive some either treatment or combination of, a, of a, either some selective areas of repair and a treatment. So I hear what you say, yeah. but it's not making sense to me that you would actually touch every street in a given fiscal year that hasn't been touched before. 
if you could um, afford it, you would. If not, you would have to do um, like what Burbank does. And they have even sub areas of their, um, they have even like a sub area. So like, let's say we have orange area one and orange area two, where we're able to afford to do orange area one, but not orange area two. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, okay. and I, I project that you won't be able to have enough funds to touch every street. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is then if you don't have enough funds to touch every street in a given fiscal year, then do you make a policy decision that certain streets uh, above a certain PCI uh, don't get touched? Um, program? You could. Yeah, I mean, you could. Um, you could basically, yes, that's what you, so in the previous evaluation of the 2020 PMP, that was essentially the approach that um, you can only, if you can only afford so much per year, then you, um, you, in theory, select the streets that need it the most. Now, whether that is a combination of they're the worst streets that need to be rebuilt, or they're streets that are about to fall off the treatment scale, we want to put some money into them so we don't have to, so they don't fall into reconstruction. Um, and then streets that are say at uh you know an eighty five or an eighty, you know let's cross our fingers and hope that they're not at a sixty in you know seven years. So if a, a street let's say is at a seventy PCI, a fairly good rating, um, you may decide well we we aren't going to program that, but if you don't do any work on it in that year, you got to wait seven years to come back again, right? So in theory, a street that is too good to touch at that time may fall to a unfavorable PCI in the next seven years. Is that possible? And that's possible. And so that's why, you know, as far as a financial model, we'd want to, you know, if you if you if the city borrowed money now that costs less to borrow for the next seven years versus um, waiting seven years to rebuild that street, and now it's going to cost more, much more than it would have proportionally if it we had borrowed money now to pay for that reconstruction. That might be the better approach. So, like a lot of this is like a, it's a, it's a fine, it's financial modeling um, versus, you know, um, making a policy decision about what we're not going to get to. It might make more sense to actually get to it now and save money in the future by, you know, a bond measure or something like that. Okay, well, this is very interesting. Yeah. And your presentation was very informative. And I hope you can make it work because there's a lot of adjusting and fine tuning and revisiting that this requires. You know, there is, and it's a lot, you know, and, you know, from a SAF perspective, we talk about this, the key is getting started and getting you know something moving and then we'll have to learn and and probably um, adjust but if we can get a program that's well intentioned underway that the idea is that we get to um you know a a predetermined scenario where things are sort of looking up um right now looking at the looking at it and sort of just taking an approach every year about trying to take the worst streets even though there's nothing wrong with that like i said it is a little bit um demoralizing in a way. So if we can somehow come up with a plan, even if it's not perfect, uh, and try to achieve um, a more routine approach to the street infrastructure, then that, you know that's a great start. Two quick questions, I promise. <laughs> that's fine. Um, the, uh, the zone approach. Um, you don't have council approval for that yet do you are you or do you have a direction from them that that that's the, the path we want to take or are you still looking for that? so we don't have approval i mean what basically the direction we got from the state of streets um last year was that this was interesting that we should um try to pursue this um and that we were to come back you know in the next couple of months like i think we projected this 
order to be talking about this um, with something that was a little more of a refined plan. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, the whole thing can get thrown out and it's just like, this is not for us. I'm not projecting yeah, that. Right, was, but, but no, we're not there asking. yet. Yeah, so. so your plan is the next couple of months to get that approval imprimatur or whatever you need so that you can follow this. Yeah. And, approach. you know, um, even apart from this being our approach, we need to come up with the next year's plan anyway for budget reasons for our SP1 right. application, that type of thing. Sure, sure. Um, the the, the uh, two other quick things were one, if you're looking for support from this body regarding a, a warrant analysis for um, Pasadena mission, um, I certainly would give it to you because I think it's I think it's something that's necessary and I think this is the time to do it. Um, Last, construction oversight and management. How is that currently handled? Is that something we do in-house? We hire that out? How does that happen? It's a good question. It, right now, it's a combination, um, and it's for multiple reasons. So we have um, construction inspection staff um, in-house. We have one um, inspector that's been with the city for a while, one that's um, pretty new. Um, and so... Uh, there's, you know, um, so they, they are uh, handling the inspection component of the work. Um, separately, we would usually have project management and construction management roles. Um, and in the past, uh, the city has um, utilized its in-house engineers for a good portion of the, of the project management. Um, because there's a lot of aspects of the project management. There's like the day-to-day -day what's going on. There's invoicing, certified payroll, prevailing wage issues, submittals and responses and um, lots of paperwork type things. Um, and so some of that, so, you know, so the day-to-day -day coordination would be a little bit in-house and then a lot of the more standard need to understand the regulations and how the programs work or um, if we're getting special fine funding from different sources, understanding how to report to those funding sources, we would kind of outsource that. Um, and then the construction management will also mostly be outsourced because that would be you know, keeping the um, contractor on schedule. Um, so in this particular project, to the one that's going on today, we're doing the construction inspection in-house because we have staff. We didn't have engineering staff when we started this in December. So we um, had some of the project management tasks outsourced. We now have a little bit more staff than we had then, so it's kind of shared. Um, we're still outsourcing the construction management part of it. So to answer your question, it kind of depends on what the resources are we have in-house. In Sometimes um, we even outsource the construction inspection part of it if we don't have a construction inspector available or it's a really specialty type project like the ITS projects. Um, our staff might not necessarily understand, you know, not have that knowledge base on how to um, uh, analyze a, which is really like a computer network installation. So um, what we expect is that we'll be able to return to the model where we're, our engineering staff have large day-to-day -day oversight of the project, our, ins our in-house inspection staff are doing the day-to-day -day inspection, and then for all the specialty project management staffs that have to do with paperwork and finances, and then coordinating with the contractor is done um, outsourced. So because um, the other element I didn't mention is that um, a lot of the co contractor coordination and the sort of paperwork part of project management is really dependent on the design um, and the specification that the designers made. So for example, um, if a contractor says, I can't get the type of asphalt that you wanted, how's this type? That might not be a decision we want to make in house. It might be a decision we want the designer who made that judgment call based on that geotechnical information to make. And so usually we we um, either use the designing company as the project manager, or we have the project manager. We set up a separate contract with the designer to sort of help out the project manager during the project. Okay. So so it, it just depends. Kind of depends. Great. I hope that answers your question. No, it does. So it okay. Depends on the needs of the project, and, and it sounds like we have some flex and we have some skill and ability in house to provide some of these services. So mm -hmm. we're not outsourcing everything. Exactly. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair.
And last couple questions, and thank you very much for the presentation, Ted. One is when we look at the pre the options that were being presented, which I know are going to come back from Tool. Um, we also need to figure out how does those projects and those strategies l lay out with what would be impacted by zones. And the other is, do we know from planning if we have um, any other proposed um, development that we need to then layer in and consider? We wouldn't if if a developer is going to go in and build something. We don't want to redo the street right there because they're going to need to probably um, dig it up to get to conduits and other things. Yeah, in that, their construction. That is part of the consideration. So we do know where developer projects are theoretically supposed to happen and what streets they would impact. A good example is, say, you know, the 1020 L Central project that's uh, across the street from the library. Um, but some of those unknowns are, you know, we don't know if that project is actually going to go forward. And so um, we can basically build a scenario where we expect it to, and we might not include those streets in a plan because, um, you know, the, in theory, they're going to be redone under this other development project. Um, but, you know, another a counter to that argument is that you know, if the project's not secured and the, the land is for sale, which it is, maybe that project doesn't get built in the next few years. Um, do we want to consider those streets? So, um, yeah, the, we have to do the best we can to not redo work. Um, again, on the current approach, it doesn't involve areas. We're bound to, if we're going to be replacing water and sewer lines, we're bound to cut into the streets we just resurfaced because... We need to connect a water line in the street that's adjacent to it. Um, the water lines don't follow the boundaries of the streets; they're usually right down the center of the street. Um, so we have to would have to, you know, basically cut into new a uh, new pavement to replace a new connected water line. So that's an advantage with the area approach is that you can you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, there, there's bound to be we're trying to minimize um, redo work, but there's bound to be some here and there. Yeah. And last question is, um, do you need a recommendation from us? Or are you going to come back? And this is just for informational purposes for tonight. Um, so we'll we'll take anything. I mean, if there's some ideas that you want us to incorporate as we, you know, we're, we're a good way into the process, but we didn't come to you with a complete plan that you could, you know, um, and that was on purpose so that you could have some time to um, give us some feedback, but we will be coming back. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. You can give us some ideas now, but this is the last time you're going to see it. I think if you could come back with again the missing information, the total cost, the slurry costs, those those estimates that you're um, still that are still in process. Of course. Anything else? I need to ask though. Uh, would it be preferable to have a recommendation from us in that you have seven project zones shown? Uh, they don't necessarily coincide with the five councilmanic districts. Um, would it be better for us to say we approve it in concept or, or that would be helpful um, because then we'll, you know, we kind of a baseline for this is a good area map. Um, you know, when I initially mentioned this was both a science and an art, it was, you know, coming up with the numbers of how much pavement area there was, uh, avoiding council districts, but it was also kind of trying to portion off the city in such a way that you could do this area and it kind of made sense. Um, so if this looks, we, this felt right for us, if this, if you think this looks good to you, that would be helpful to say that you um, are largely on board with how we've arranged the map and we, we should move forward with our plans to incorporate the new data and provide a recommendation. I just have a question. I think the answer for me is yes, but I was just looking at this uh, slide here and the um, chart at the bottom right, listing each zone in the total area, and it's, they're all pretty much even. Uh, what is the, so the, the seven zones, and if you've said it before and I missed it, I apologize. There's this NA, and then it says 3.8. What is that? That's your yellow your arterial streets. Ah. So again, we we left those out on purpose um, because they 
we assume they have a different pathway. They're Fremont, um, Mon a little bit of Monterey, Pasadena, Mission, Oak, Via Del Rey. Um, they can be incorporated into projects, residential projects, but um, they really skew the numbers. Like if if Fremont is in your um, is in your zone, it's not in great condition. It's a large surface area. It really throws right. the numbers off. But we're trying to focus on a residential. Program. So the major streets where a different approach should be taken. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, I certainly think this, I've said it probably multiple times, I think this approach makes sense, and I think it's something we should support. Well, then why don't I make a motion that um, we support the concept of individual street, um, residential street mapping into pr proposed seven zones, knowing that there's still issues to be worked out with the plan, funding, um, timing, but the basic concept of looking at um, dealing with city streets, residential streets, um, in a at this point seven year cycle or some cycle makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Is there a second? I, I second. Oh. And also adding that it is uh, independent. The the mapping is independent of the chair uh, members um, districts as well. Given that's, I feel like that's also a very important piece to that. Yes, that the that the boundaries uh, do not will not coincide with specific council districts. And then, uh, uh, Commissioner Fisher, second. Uh, I I second. Now, do you want to take the roll? Vice Chair Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Abelson. Yes. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. And Commissioner Zavala. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Very helpful. We'll continue on our agenda. Our next item is approval of minutes from our December 19th meeting. Liana, it was very nice to share this and this um, Reports to follow the city's recommended um, city clerk guidelines on how to construct minutes. Any comments, changes? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Vice Chair. So I, I, I think they look great, and I, I like the new streamlined approach. It makes it a little easier to review. Um, under i'm trying to figure out how to refer to this so it's it's item two the slow streets program and in particular it's two i think it's two b which is and correct me if i have it wrong which is the oak street discussion okay great so it's page three of the minutes towards the bottom commission action in motion the first sentence uh, uh, looks clear. And it was just the second sentence I thought we might want to clarify. So in the first sentence, we talk about more permanent center median striping at Fletcher and Oak. And then there's the sense if funding and staff resources allow to prior prioritize Oak and Marengo and Oak and Fremont, I'm just not quite clear what this reference is. Um, and so I don't know if we need to add some language, um, what exactly what our direction was for those two locations. I don't know if anybody remembers as we sit here. Um, cause I know we talked about Fletcher and Oak because it was not all way stop controlled and there's a marked crosswalk. So we thought it was important to, tr to maintain the center median there to uh, reinforce the fact that there's a crosswalk. I, it's the second sentence. I don't know, Ted, if you remember or you can help. Um, if funding and staff resources are allowed to prioritize Oak and Marengo and Oak and Fremont, I don't quite understand that. Um, I, if I recall, and it may not be accurate, I, I think that the intention was that um, if we were to uh, maintain or make some uh, small improvements to 
the existing installation that would uh, sort of live beyond the temporary setup that um, we would focus on Oak and Marengo and Oak and Fremont as the locations to do that. I think there was some recommendations to maybe use some other materials. I, I may be wrong, but I think that's what that, the intention behind that sentence is. Okay. Um, if you'd like, you know, if we're not confident with it, we can re go back and take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. So, so that would be option A. Option B, I'm thinking as, as we're all talking is maybe we, and we can go back and revisit this later, but um, if funding and staff resources allow uh, comma to consider um, uh, what's the right word? Uh, additional uh, retaining the existing improvements, um, adding other improvements, or we just don't remember. Um, I was just thinking if we could do it now. If not, we can't. It's okay. Uh, perhaps it would be if funding and staff resources allow to um, uh, to uh, install more. Um, uh, I don't know if it may more stationary and uh, mitigated mitigated uh, efforts. Uh, for because I think the intention was that um, the commission liked that there was improvements there and thought there was maybe a, a better way to uh, configure those intersections um, without the say the tall delineators right um, so maybe instead of to prioritize to consider um, more permanent more permanent. Okay. Consider more permanent materials. Right. That, yeah. What do you think? So more permanent and <laughs> um, uh, more durable materials at Oak and Marengo and Oak and Fremont. How about to consider, just trying to keep this, uh, to consider alternate materials um, materials for <coughs> those two locations? Yeah. So instead of prioritize, sense. it says consider alternate materials for. How's that? Is yeah, that right? I think that makes sense. More durable materials? Alternate. I think alternate sort of covers it. Okay. Yeah. Consider alternate materials. Sorry to just. No problem. Yeah, to get it right. <laughs> or maybe to consider alternatives for the newest, like newest function. I guess not. No, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into this. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know. Staff direction was remove it. Generally speaking, remove all this. And then, right? And then we said, wait a minute, a couple of these locations, maybe we should retain them. Um, and I think these two, the discussion and was. And use alternate materials. Yeah. yeah. And just ad adjust the materials themselves, but keep the concept. Yeah, that makes sense. That's it. Okay. I have one actually. So, actually, I have two. So for the each of the motions, um, the absence are listed as none for both motions, and I would assume that maybe it might be good to put in the other members who are not there then. Um, so Commissioner Fisher was not here, uh, was not there that day. Um, so like listing Commissioner Fisher as absent for each of the motions and or and do so we forth. have to have absence? Is that required in any format? Okay. okay. Well, it's so to that point, though, where I thought you were headed was uh, with regard to the two matters where 
uh, Vice Chair Hughes and I recused ourselves. Oh, that might be important. Should we be listed as, as, as absent? Yeah, yeah, that too. Because we were not on the diet. Right. On the diet. right. So I, I would suggest for to to your point, yeah. right? For for the Grand Hermosa two A that I be listed as absent, and for the Oak okay. that Oak I was absent. Vice Chair um, Hughes. So if you if you wanted to, of course, one option is to bring the minutes back corrected. But if you wanted to approve them with the understanding that we will follow the city clerk's direction on how to appropriately list your how to be listed. Yes, that works for maybe me. you okay. need to be recused. I sure. don't know. Yeah, yeah. yet another category. <laughs> another. Um, the second change is just um, on the commissioner communications. Um, for myself, um, it says here, like, like the way that it was worded is that I was referring to the Tiger Run having 3,000 participants, but it was Oreo Fest having the 3,000 participants um, for the run. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, Mr. Uh, I just have a few suggestions on page three. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back to page two, where we talk about the in-person comments. I don't know if it's a small where David Johnson expressed his opposition to the project, but it, the real oppositions were the bike lane. I don't know if we want to be more definitive because that was for Mr. Johnson, as well as Lisa and um, Ms. Davis. Same thing with Stephen uh, Koch, opposition to the bike lanes, and Bob Simpson to the bike lane as opposed to the project. Because there are other things that some of them said they liked, but it was the bike lane, but there was I, a lot of opposition. I know there was a couple in particular that um, had voiced support for um, or had voiced that they uh, did not support any aspect of the entire program. Um, yeah, I think that was Mr. Johnson. So maybe that one we could leave. So, so if we thought. we don't have to. yeah, we could um, we could go back and and see if there was a particular expression of support for something in particular um, for the, the different speakers. And then on page three, on my comment under in-person comments to be to express your support for the project and other opportunities more permanent, but I think it's other more permanent opportunities. Which is like the materials. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And then um, on page four, Uh, I think it was Mr. Steele spoke about and it was his opinion on the slow traffic. It was his opinion that the traffic uh, was traffic was slow on the Orange Grove and Mission. That was the issue about the traffic flow, that it was slow. And, and then I don't know if we want to put under the uh, minutes, approve the corrected minutes because we did go amended because we did take changes at the meeting prior to approval. Um, and then Commissioner Abelson on your comments about the uh, Arroyo Fest, where it says he commented that he, that he participated in the Arroyo Fest and walked on the freeway and it was amazing. But did you also, didn't you also talk about the public came out um, in support, you also thanked the public that came out to make comments on slow streets. That certainly sounds like me, but I <laughs> specifically. Anyway, I that. had that in my notes. Okay. So I just didn't know if you wanted to make um, that to it. I don't know. And it depends, you know, how granular do we, okay. you know, I'm, I'm okay with what's there, but if it, if you want to change it, that's okay. I'm not going to. Um, so that would be the um, comments on the minutes. If anyone would exercise a motion for approval as amended. Mm -hmm. On where, where I made the comment. 
I still can't hear you. Oh, corrected, something like that you said. Was oh, just as a, as amended, yes, as, or corrected or amended, yes. And the, it was approved. That was the only thing, is it? Because we made comments and made changes at the meeting. So with the changes that outlined here, would anyone like to exercise a motion for approval of the amended minutes? I move for approval of the minutes as amended. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Commissioner Zavala. With that, um, Fiona, do you want to take a vote? Uh, Vice Chair Hughes? Yes. Commissioner Abelson? Yes. Commissioner Fisher? And Commissioner Zavala? Aye. Zero. Thank you all. Um, the next item on our agenda is status report on projects. Um, thank you, Vice Chair. So we'll give you a, a, a very brief, um, we'll pick a couple projects to give you some brief updates on, um, as we usually do. Um, you want to go first, David? Do you want to go first? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioners. I wanted to give you guys an update. Uh, over the last two or three months, um, we've been working with um, LA Metro, um, Caltrans and the Federal Highway Administration to update um, what we call the uh, FTIF system. So it's the uh, Federal Transportation Improvement Plan. So every two years, uh, projects that are either um, regionally significant or funded through a federal government, state, or have local funds and that are part of the FTIP system have to be updated in a FTIP system that Metro um, controls. So um, last year, 2023, before the closing of December, of the end of the year, we needed to update, uh, I believe, seven projects that we had in the FTIP system. So some of them had been deobligated. Some of them were outdated. You know, some of them needed to be updated, their project status and their timeline. Um, so the last two, like I said, last two or three months, we've been working closely with Metro to get those projects updated. Um, so we cleaned up the entire system because on some of those projects hadn't been touched in a while. Um, so some of those projects, just to give you a quick rundown on that, is um, the Fair Oaks ITS um, project, um, um, the one that has the Rogan funds, uh, where KOA is the uh, consultant, the, the $10 million project. That's part of the uh, FTIP system that we carried over for the next um, um, fiscal year for the uh, FTIP system. One of the other projects that we also updated was the uh, the HSIP project for the um, RRFB project for the uh, Mission in, um, in Diamond, Mission in Fairview, and Fremont and Linden. Uh, we also had another um, HSIP project that we closed out. Uh, one of our former associate engineers closed out that project, so we just needed to um, uh, produce some final um, documents and submit them to, uh, to LA Metro for completion, so that project was um, finally completed. So that was the ATMS project, the Central TCS uh, for Fair Oaks. Approximately the funds were uh, $580,000. Uh, the other project that we have on the FTIP system right now is the Fremont Huntington ITS project, uh, the $10 million that we received from Measure R. Um, so that project it, it was supposed to, um, the funds were going to lapse in May, so we needed to make uh, an update to the project timeline. So we basically pushed the project timeline um, one year um, so that we can buy additional time and move forward and um, amend the uh, funding agreement for that project. And then we had some other um, projects in there that were had been de-obligated um, in the past year that they were, they were just sitting in the system. Um, and there were also duplicate projects that were very similar um, to existing projects that we had in the FTIP system that we asked uh, Metro and um, Caltrans just to verify their records. Um, and we check our, our records as well in-house to make sure that we weren't removing any projects um, out of the system. So uh, we came to an agreement that there was one duplication of projects and there was uh, the obligated uh, project that was still in the system as well that we removed from the system. So we basically cleaned up the uh, entire FTIP system. So 
we should now be um, up to date in our um, FTIP system that we have with Metro. Um, the final thing that I'll mention is that we do have some other projects that are in the uh, FTIP system that were previously um, de-obligated, uh, I think approximately uh, three years, um, I think under the um, former director. Um, and we're, once we get um, funding agreements for the new, um, some of the other projects, um, if Metro determines that they're eligible to be part of the FTIP system, then they will be added to uh, the system at that point. Does that mean all our Measure M projects are okay? Um, well, in terms of Measure M, so typically Metro makes the determination whether they're going to be part of the FTIP system. Um, some of the other grants, like um, some of the other Measure M um, projects, sometimes they may have other forms of um, updates that we have to give, so we kind of give them quarterly um, updates or expenditure reports every quarter to Metro. So for the uh, Measure M project that we have, the $6 million um, active transportation project, we typically file a quarterly um, report to LA Metro, but it's not part of the FTIP system. If that, if that makes answers your question. In some of the, the Measure M projects you're referring to, the council or the commission recommended that get sent to the JPA, um, David looked into this too. They're actually not in this FTIP system, yeah. as far as we understand. They're they're handled separately, so it's a so it's a complicated process. They're still on the radar. Oh, oh they're, yes, they're yes, not on the absolutely. radar. David's working on funding agreement yeah. for them. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to the vice chair's point, though, when you say de-obligated, <clears throat> de-obligated sure. projects, that you know, unsettles me. So sure. And, and you you mentioned that there was one I think one that was yeah to be deobligated. What what is that or was that? So it was a bike uh, project. Um, I think it. I can't remember the figure number, but it was on Fair um, Fair Oaks of Centro. It was a bikeway improvement. It was to put um, some bike lanes. Okay. Um, and it was I believe three or four years ago that it had been deobligated and it was approved by the council and then the Metro board as well. And deobligated meaning that we didn't complete the project within the time required, or is that my off base there? What does that mean? So I'll add that these are probably projects you've never heard of because nobody did. They got into the system somehow. <laughs> And they probably they didn't necessarily have funding behind them either. Okay. So um, it's not that we lost any money. In fact, David um, did a lot of work to keep money that we have. Like for example, for the RRFB, um, there was three steps. There was the FTIP process. There was a yeah. um, project extension request, and there was also invoicing paperwork that had to be filed in time by the end of the year to get that money saved. So we in um, what David didn't mention it was there's that we think that there's additional money that we might be able to utilize that hasn't been. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, so we're, we're he's working on that right now to try to almost rescue additional funding that was in the system that hasn't been obligated yet. Right. Well, thank you, David, and, yeah. and keep yeah. it up. But I and I didn't ask the question to pass judgment. I just want to make sure I understand what you're telling us. And sure. bottom line, it doesn't sound like there's anything that we've discussed here that's fallen off the radar or the funding for which has disappeared. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, so one thing that was de-obligated was spending the Rogan money on the loop ramp project, because now the current plan is to spend the Rogan money on the ITS project on Fair Oaks, and the Measure R money gets spent on the loop, the hook yeah. ramp project. Okay. Or sorry, the loop ramp project. Right. This the the Rogan money is de-obligated from the hook ramp project. So. Yeah, so there wasn't a, a loss there per se. Um, the, the recovery that David's working on might not work out, um, but that was stuff that was funding that um, probably you had never heard of. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, one other quick update is the I know there was um, earlier mentions about tool design. So, we did, oh, I did meet with the consultant back in November 30th and just wanted to do a check-in to see where we're exactly with the uh, deliverables. So um, we're still waiting. So we haven't uh, received any deliverables um, just yet on the tool design. So 
once we have something, then we'll definitely update the uh, the commission on that. Um, Do you know exactly when you think pool's going to come back? We were we were supposed to have it by the end of the year. We don't have it yet, so we're trying to get it from them. Um, so and hopefully any day, and then we can bring that forward to the commission to review. Because am I correct in that there was a concept of some design that would supersede the hook ramp and um, that or loop ramp, and that I mean, if we you know we if something's going to then take the place or possibly yes um so do you I, I can mention that one and then you want to talk about maybe the north south one so uh, um so we were actually going to update you on that tonight so um the when uh david had presented the um hntb's uh scope of work i think it was probably over the summer for um evaluating the loop ramp um, environmental project approval and environmental document phase. Um, the commission had some recommendations to tweak that scope. So we had um, our consultant at HNTB um, review uh, the commission's comments. Um, and at the same time, the tool design evaluation had happened in which um, that team proposed, um, I forgot what they're calling it. It's kind of like a the median U-turn? Yes, the median U-turn yeah. um, that would be near the War Memorial in lieu of the loop ramp. So we just really uh, viewed that as just another alternative that could be considered in the project. So what we asked um, our HNTB consultant to do is basically among the other alternatives that is being considered that you talked about, the loop ramp, a diamond ramp, you know, nothing, um, is to add that into as one of the alternatives. And so we just recently received a new scope from HNTB just to consider that in addition to the other work that he's already going to be doing, including the loop ramp um, design evaluation, um, uh, so that we can bring that scope to council. Now, um, we can't do any of this until measure until Metro gives us a funding agreement so we can afford to do that evaluation. Because even though we have this $80 million of Measure R money sitting there from 710, we can't actually spend any of it until we have an agreement with Metro about how we're spending it. So we're awaiting a funding agreement from Metro for that PAED phase, the project and approval and environmental document phase, so that HNTB can move forward with that scope. So it, um, when we get that funding agreement, uh, we'll have this figured out and we'll you know, share with this commission our new approach, uh, which is basically our old approach with you know a 2% difference, um, and then bring that to council for approval, if that makes sense. What is the role of uh, Tool versus HNTV TV on that project? Um, no real role other than offering their idea to HNTB for HNTB to evaluate as an alter as an alternative. Um, so they offered a U-turn in front of the War Memorial Building for HNTB to evaluate. Is that? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a little bit uh, farther north of War Memorial. It's basically that um, vacant space uh, north of the between the War Memorial and. The dentist office. Dentist office. Yeah, yeah that's the dentist. Um, and so a tool, and we haven't seen the. We just saw it during the, um, presentation. Presentation, but we don't have a copy of that just yet for the report from the report. But they had just um recommended this what you call a median U turn, um, and so we simply asked, can this be considered as an alternative in um HNTB's approach? And they said. Yeah, we'll consider any feasible alternative. Well, is it an alternative or an idea for HNTV to evaluate? Um, it, it's kind of both. Like they'll, um, HNTV has to, in theory, evaluate all feasible alternatives, which probably would narrow down to a half dozen ideas, um, including the loop ramp. And so, um, you know, they would they do their evaluation, including. Um, modeling and constructability and those types of elements uh environmental impact uh, as part of their report so um to answer your question 
you know, tools only role would be if HNTB uh, had questions or wanted some specifics on what the idea was so that they could, they'd have enough information to evaluate it as part of their um, design. We're kind of, we're steering away from the word alternative evaluation because um, that's not necessarily something that Metro funds regularly. We want this to be, you know, viable ideas for use of that money. Um, so, you know, in, you know, you could look at it as a sort of like a set of alternatives, but as far as HNTB is concerned, they're going to narrow down what's the most um, appropriate uh, um, solution and, you know, what what's that going to take for environmental clearance? But, uh, does it carry the status as an alternative to the loop ramp, even if HNTB says uh, operationally it wouldn't work? No. Okay. So it, 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 this sense that we're using the word alternative loosely as something something that HNTB will consider, given that it's on the t table of ideas, just as doing nothing is an alternative, even though we understand that doing nothing doesn't offer any solution to the problem. Thanks, David. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. I think the only other update that I had was at the last uh, council meeting. I'm not sure we mentioned this uh, to the commission, but uh, we have requested a budget uh, adjustment through our, I believe it was our Measure M and Measure R to be able to expend money for um, traffic um, equipment and devices uh, because with our uh, former, with our existing Measure M, Measure R funds through the budget process, we weren't necessarily uh, permitted to use some of that fund for traffic device control. Um, so we made that request and it was approved. So, um, some of those requests or asks or, um, recommendations that we're going to be, um, um, requesting or doing in the next uh, couple of months, well, in the short term would be the edge line that we had discussed on Huntington drive, uh, as well as the, um, the vehicle feedback, um, radar signs that we had also, our, uh, discussed earlier with the commission. Uh, for Huntington Drive and as well as for uh, Fremont Avenue um, and as well as a uh, replacement of bot stops um, along Huntington Drive uh, between Fletcher and uh, Garfield Avenue. And then finally, the restri um, restriping of um, Fremont Avenue, which includes the center line and the double um, left turn lane and some of the um, lane lines on Fremont Avenue. Um, I just want to emphasize the amount of work that David and our team did for um, the F, what we're calling the F type process. Um, it's a two year cycle. So this is the, only, this is our first shot that our current team had to do this cleanup and it incorporated, you know, having Caltrans district staff, talking to Metro funding staff, talking to this Caltrans area staff, talking to Metro programming staff. And it was a, a lot of, uh, work in coordination um, to set up funding for the next couple of years. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, go around these other questions, Commissioner Zavala, um, on this any is, other projects. This is actually, I feel, um, well, I just wanted to sort of follow up with like any update on like the removal of the Slow Streets program. Has that been ordered yet? Um, or is that sort of just kind of being like in limbo or waiting for that. So um, our approach um, was to take the commission's recommendation um, to the city council to discuss. Um, we haven't had that opportunity yet. We expect to do that in uh, February. Uh, so really um, no movement so far, just uh, incorporating everything that we learned from that meeting, which we got a lot of great feedback from you um, to present to council. Gotcha, thank you. Is that it? Yeah, that's it for me, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Abelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. So just a couple of questions. Uh, does the staff still meet regularly with the city of Pasadena on transportation related matters? Yeah, every once a month. Okay. Um, is there anything I know, you know, they, they, there are a few projects here where they are um, 
we're coordinating with them. Is there anything significant in terms of forward movement on any of the projects um, that we're working with Pasadena on or which may impact us that they're working on that you've been made aware of in the past month or two? Um, nothing really significant. I think that some of their um, projects, for example, um, you know, the, like the Columbia project and the St. John and Pasadena project, they're just sort of moving through their um, process. I don't know if they've got their funding agreements secured just yet. Um, I know that they were doing a, um, a solicitation for consultants for um, some of the uh, 710 stub planning process last we heard, and I don't know if they've awarded uh, that work yet. So we're just sort of keeping our um, ear to the ground with them. Um, really, our last meeting um, was about, uh, actually, we were talking about the FTEP. We were exchanging um, notes on that. Uh, so no, I don't I don't think there's anything really significant to report. Okay. And are they, I know they have their long-term major project uh, along the Columbia Street corridor. Is there anything they are working on shorter term, whether it's, um, any kind of striping improvements or anything like that, or are they just sitting on it and waiting until the big project moves forward? Um, they're open to short-term improvements that we sort of collaborate on together. For example, in talking about, you know, we, um, David's been working on looking at the Orange Grove project that's sort of half into our Measure M right. work and half into the Columbia Orange Grove intersection improvement. And so if we have any short-term recommendations, which we're kind of working to formulate now on that, they're willing to coordinate that work with us. I, um, I know I brought, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, I brought it up before, but you know, the Columbia street between Orange Grove and Fair Oaks is the wild west. Right. And in, in part it's because it's shared mostly Pasadena, right? Um, very wide, virtually no, con in terms of striping, there's no, there's a double yellow center line and that is it pretty much. Um, very wide street. Um, since the since there are projects in the works longer term that will help with all of that, but they are longer term, um, I'm wondering if we can have a conversation with them about um, the addition of edge stripe on Columbia Street, at least between Orange Grove and Fremont, um, or Orange Grove and Pasadena Avenue. Um, it's virtually uncontrolled, and I know they came to us I think it missed maybe a couple of years ago now with a suggestion at Columbia and Pasadena. And then it's, there was some initial concern about parking, um, but I think that was addressed and then nothing happened. So I'm wondering if we can resurrect a conversation with them about some relatively inexpensive, inexpensive way of managing traffic flow on that street in that corridor. Um, and, and then I'll be quiet, but I have a, a, ancillary comment, which is what I've noticed increasingly, and I'm wondering if anybody else here had southbound Pasadena Avenue as it approaches Columbia, all right, the T intersection, most of the traffic is turning left and then turning right on a Fremont and continuing south. So it, there's a large backup, especially during rush hour, peak hours of the day. What I've noticed, because I typically turn right because that's where I'm headed towards Orange Grove, is that a lot of people who don't want to wait, wait in that long line to turn left, right? They'll turn right, so going westerly on Columbia, and then mid-block do a U-turn, and then right head east, and then turn right on a Fremont. Is that a tool design? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, and it's so, okay. very, very dangerous and unsafe. So I'm wondering. If in addition to talking to them about maybe adding some edge striping on each side of the street, is it possible to post a no U-turn or something like that, bid block or some other appropriate control to try to manage that? Um, of course, everything you know devolves to enforcement, but at least um, it might help so that with some spot and if it's appropriate, they do it with some spot enforcement. Maybe it'll stop that dangerous behavior. So. Yeah, we could talk to him about that. I mean, certainly we've talked about um, in relation to the longer term Columbia project about doing some striping on um, Columbia. And um, ultimately, the, the thought was that it would might require a signal 
um, uh, you know, repositioning, which would sort of defeat the purpose of a short term, but solutions like U-turn signs, edge lines, they might be something that we could do pretty easily so we can talk to them about that. Thanks very much. That's it. Just a couple points, mindful of the hour. Um, on the street improvements, you've answered that for me. On the Measure M, you're saying proposed projects to be submitted for project cycle requests. Is that what you're referring to, to Metro? Um, so, so a couple things here. So the previous Measure M, and we call this Measure M, there's three different flavors of Measure M. So we call this Measure M MSP. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember what that stands for. <laughs> um, something about multi subregional projects. Yes. So the the MSP flavor of Measure M. Um, so the projects that you've already um, recommended that haven't been approved are in separate project are separate projects here that David is working on uh, funding agreements with Metro to bring about. Um, this Measure M project funding request refers to the half a million dollars or so that's still outstanding that hasn't been programmed. And um, we have to do it as a team, you know, Burbank, um, locking out of Flint Ridge, Glendale, Pasadena, and a little portion of LA County. I think we all have to decide together how to do it. Um, we didn't do it last year out of, you know, it, it costs a lot of money for us to do the whole process. We have to hire a consultant to do all the paperwork and, um, convince Metro there's a good use of funds. So our thought was that we would be returning to this early 2024. We we think we're still on track. Um, and that's what this is, is that once we have an understanding of how much funding there is and whether or not we're, as a region, we're, we're going to make a request, then we'll want to discuss that with the commission so that our requests are founded in your recommendation before we you know, and bring you have an I, some ideas of how of what you would use that for, for with the collaborative other partners. Yeah, I mean, um, the dream is that there's some magical regional project that we all contribute to, but it's unlikely. So it would probably just be projects that we want to spend our own funding on. Um, it could not be another um, Arroyo Fest on the freeway, could it? No, these are typically capital projects. Yeah, the um. There is that open streets funding is still available annually for us to apply for, but um, this was a tough one on active SGV and it might yeah. be a few years before we do that one again. We'll probably do the mission to mission one again more frequently, but um, the, the Royal Street, Golden Street. Yeah, Street. exactly. Yeah. The other question I was trying to find on here, and maybe I missed it, the, the crosswalks, We've been talking about that Commissioner President Dunlap has been interested in for Huntington. Am I missing them somewhere? Um, as far as where they would where I would find the status of those? So on page three of ten, um pedestrian crossing devices, uh they right. he had recommended them under there. We felt that it was an appropriate prioritization to move those devices into the Huntington project itself because they're going to be such a um, expensive and, um, you know, we'll have to coordinate those installations with what we come up with for the Huntington redesign. Which relates to the, the tool design. Exactly. So we think that's probably a better way to organize that, um, okay. those projects, especially if we change the um, parkway configuration or the third lane on Huntington in some way that's going to affect how those pedestrian signals work. I think you addressed the Federal Transportation Improvement Plan. You mentioned that. On the highway safety plans, these particular ones, is there a strategy to make sure the community knows about these? Um, so at some point, these are um, Yes, there is a strategy. Um, you, a lot of this, um, a lot of the focus of these projects is actually in the Huntington, Fair Oaks, and Fremont corridors. So our thought was to consider this um, as additional funding for those projects for specific goals. 
Yeah, because I'm just thinking as I was looking, thinking, well, make sure that people are aware, but then if these are going to be folded into the full Huntington tool, conceptual, everything, that we just need to make sure that we that we piece everything correctly and that the, the community would, with meetings or charrettes or whatever knows all of the elements. Yeah, that's our hope. I mean, when we when we bring back a the, the tool design work was a very high level, large scale look at the three corridors. When we bring back specific recommendations about what we can spend our actual $16 million on, our hope is to um, show you that along with these specific uses and projects and how they would be incorporated also. We haven't spent much time on these HSIP cycle 11 projects um, because honestly, we're still trying to deliver HSIP cycle seven projects, I think. Yeah. So the, like the RRFBs, um, which are um, are probably our next uh, bid package after we um, we have other public works, non-transportation bid packages that have to go out before that one goes out because of um, funding deadlines. So we haven't really touched this HSIP money um, just yet before we can get that other HSIP money spent. But to your point, we definitely want the public to understand how these projects will fit into the other aspects of the those corridors. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. And thank you, David. Sure. Any other questions on the project? Okay. Sorry, Moving. Vice Chair. Oh, go ahead, <laughs> please. Because uh, I, I wouldn't want a meeting to go by without it coming up. Um, Garfield Monterey. <laughs> I was waiting for that <laughs> signal. No, um, we don't. We is don't there have anything on that preventing one. us from having a signal warrant analysis done? Just our our workload. That's all. Yeah, it's it, it, you know it's not something we've forgotten about. Um, we are really trying to prioritize. Um, you know, in two ways. Number one, what are the what are the council's main directives, and that's streets and sidewalks. Um, and then number two, where are areas that if we don't move these projects, we're going to lose funding. Um, so because that's not necessarily a risk for there, you know, it's not that that project's not important. We just haven't focused our very limited resources on getting it done. Understood. So, so when when you have the ability to do that, is that something that's one of our on call folks can handle? Or is that going to be subjected to a long process of selecting a, an expert consultant? To nope. Uh, we would go right to an on-call. Um, but we, we're trying to line up on-calls for, in particular, some of the Measure M projects that we just talked about, um, Orange Grove, um, Bear Oaks and Gravalia. So we're really trying to focus on those types of on-call efforts first. Sure. So when you can get to it... Or it's it's putting a task order together and then having a consultant pair the analysis. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, well, we'll move on. Um, our city council representatives not here, so we'll move on from that. Commissioner communications. Start with Commissioner Zaval. Any comments? Um, just wanted to say happy new year, everybody. Um, it's been a great. I think a couple of years that I've spent on the commission so far, I feel like I'm learning more and more every time I come back here. And um, just want to say, I look forward to this next year with everybody. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Commissioner Abelson. Well, I don't know if I can top Commissioner Zabala's comments. I thought those were great. I, I just, I'm not going to add anything to your list. Don't worry. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much to Transportation Manager Pena for all your hard work and all, all of your accomplishments um, as you've shared with us tonight. It's it's really impressive and we're happy, we're thrilled to have you. And Ted, as you know, um, uh, you're invaluable. We really appreciate all your help and support. Um, and we're looking forward to another exciting year of getting projects moving forward and and uh, out there and visible to the to to the residents. Um, uh, and doing some great things. So thank you very much. Um, I also would like to echo and thank um, David Pena and you, um, Director Gerber for all your efforts and work. And I think the project update lists are really excellent. You know, we're eager to get a lot of things done. We'll be really excited to see the tool concepts and how everything sort of fits together as we look long-term. 
um, looking forward to for coming back with the slurry estimates, project estimates for the streets, um, and how we can impact that. Because I know, as Commissioner Abelson said, the you know the residents have been looking forward to improvements. But I think a lot has been accomplished, and my hat's off to you for all the work that you and your team do, and pulling it all together and keeping us updated is really much appreciated. And it's going to be an exciting 2024. So thank you. Thank you for staying so late as well. And I thank you for everyone who watches and um, views the meetings. Thank you for your participation. And thank you to Liana, who keeps us all together. So with that, um, Commissioner, I mean, um, <laughs> staff comments. Um, so I just, if you don't have anything, I just have two. Um, first, uh, we would normally conduct um, selection of officers in January, but um, this meeting actually takes place one day before the first council meeting of the year in which they appoint new and reappoint uh, commissioners, which is the reason that um, former Commissioner uh, Dunlap is not joining us tonight. Uh, he is on the agenda to be possibly reappointed tomorrow as a commissioner um, to MTech. But our thought was once we have a full commission again, um, we would uh, do selection of officers. So we'll expect to do that with a full commission in February. So that's the first item. Second item is, I know I'm bearing the lead here, but I wanted to introduce uh, Michael Vartanians. Thanks for waiting to the rest of the meeting here. Uh, Michael is our new principal engineer. So he is gonna be um, overseeing our engineering division. Um, focusing on uh, land development projects, but also the capital improvement uh, program. So some impacts to um, our commission here. So uh, Michael came to us from city of Pasadena of all places. So welcome, Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you for being here. Welcome. And uh, if, we, if there's nothing else from staff, um, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you all then with that, I will adjourn adjourn the meeting at 922. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.